Okay, I think there are still a few people still joining, but let's make a start. I think most people are here. Um, so welcome to this Centre for Business Taxation Conference on Pillar 2, what will be the impact? My name is Michael Dever. I'm the director of the centre. Um, and uh, a silver lining of the pandemic is that because we are online, we have people joining us from all over the world, and we have many more people uh, attending today than we would have done if we had had it in a lecture theatre in Oxford. So uh, welcome to everybody, wherever you happen to be. Uh, pillar two, obviously, and pillar one reflect kind of huge interest of the tax community throughout the world. Um, not surprisingly, because they're generally acknowledged to be the most dramatic reforms we've seen for a century. Um, I could give you one or two sites. What other people have said on this, Janet Yellen, the US Treasury Secretary, in October said today's agreement represents a one, once in a generation accomplishment for economic diplomacy. Larry Summers, a previous US Treasury Secretary, said this agreement is arguably the most significant international economic pact of the 21st century so far. Olaf Scholz, the German Chancellor, said this agreement will really change the world. And Joe Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winner in economics, and some colleagues went even further. They said, and they urged countries to get the details of the agreement right. And it is not an overstatement to say that society's capacity to survive and thrive depends on it. Well, we could debate whether it's an overstatement or not, but I think you get the gist. This seems like quite an important issue. Um, but today we're going to focus on pillar two, drawing on you know, recent publications by the OECD, the model rules in December and the commentary and technical guidance, which was published last month. Um, having around 140 countries to agree a minimum tax still feels like a rather unexpected and remarkable achievement. So uh, in our book, which we completed in 2019, which I imagine everybody has got, uh, and if you haven't, it's available freely on our website. Um, we actually discussed the possibility of a minimum tax and said, actually achieving it would be a tall order, but it seems to have been achieved certainly so far. Um, and congratulations to those who have managed to achieve that. So there's a lot of change coming. There's a lot to discuss. Um, there are many detailed issues about how, this, how the Pillar 2 will work in practice. I'm sure some of those will come up, but we are going to focus primarily on bigger picture issues. We want to ask questions like, you know, what will be the effects of Pillar 2 on tax competition, on profit shifting, on economic efficiency? To what extent, how, how easy it will be to get a critical mass of countries actually implementing, in, in, implementing the Pillar 2? So there's three parts to this conference, roughly equal parts. We're going to start with presentations by two of the main architects of the agreement, both of whom are very well known to you uh, in the international tax community. Pascal Santaman, who is the director of the Centre for Tax Policy and Administration at OECD, um, the father of both BEPS and uh, both the pillars. Um, then we have Itai Grinberg, uh, currently Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Office of the International Tax Council of the US Treasury and, and on leave uh, as a professor of law at Georgetown University. We're then going to go on to presentations uh, of ongoing research by uh, centre staff, the Centre for Business Taxation staff. We've been doing a great deal of research on both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, and we want to present some of that to you. And then the third part of the conference, we're going to have a panel uh, which is going to be chaired by John Bella, the Deputy Director of the Centre. Um, and that panel is going, to be, is going to be drawn from business, from the professions and academia and, uh, and from government. So that's, that's the plan. Pascal has just appeared on the screen, and without further ado, I would like to invite Pascal to, to begin. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I cannot say good to see you all because I don't see many on the screen, but indeed, uh, I think you have pretty good attendance with more than 300 people right now. Uh, happy to, to start because what matters today more than uh, listening to me is to listen to the researchers and uh, the reflections, but maybe it would be good to set the scene uh, with uh, a reminder of where we come from, where we are and, and what's next, right? So uh, going back to the basics, I, I, I think we always need to start with the basics. Basics are about tax sovereignties, um, countries dealing with their own tax system, tax treaties to try to limit uh, frictions, but also uh, on a uh, unilateral domestic uh, manner, CFC legislations, control foreign uh, companies legislations across countries to be able to limit the profit shifting to low tax jurisdictions. If we look back 
uh, in history. And, and thus the question of the, uh, um, the question of the compatibility of CFC legislations with tax treaties and the OECD years ago clarifying that CFC legislations were not contrary to uh, the model tax convention. I think this was a commentary under article one. And, and in practice, actually a system which was broken, I think I can use that word, or a system which didn't work as well as it should have. Um, I dare not mention the United States because Itai will speak after me, but I'm not sure that the part F after check the box was as uh, well functioning as, as one could have expected. Uh, when we started BEPS, there were 2000 billion of U uh, US dollar of uh, accumulated profit of American companies in Cayman and Bermuda, or at least offshore. Uh, but it's not only the US, which was slightly dysfunctioning, uh, but the European Union family was also a dysfunctioning family with uh, no external border, no more internal borders and the EU CJ uh, taking a number of decisions, weakening uh, the implementation of CFC legislation, making it almost impossible to fight uh, profit shifting within uh, that uh, space. And that's against that background, which could be described otherwise as uh, globalization without any form of tax regulation for decades that we launched in the aftermath of the global financial crisis in 2008, this exercise of introducing some form of tax regulation. We started with the end of bank secrecy, transparency, exchange of information, and we moved to BES, the first of the kids you listed, uh, kids of mine you listed, Michael, in your introduction. So we launched BEPS and uh, with its uh, 15 uh, actions, uh, one of them was on strengthening CFC legislations, action three. I have to confess that we were not as successful as we initially thought we could be because we came up with some recommendation on strengthening CFC legislation, including within the European Union. Uh, but uh, this was a best practice thing. Best practice meaning that you write a nice report and you put the report on the shelves for a next generation of tax lawyers to look at. I mean, still some progress, some interest. Uh, and, and what I find very interesting, uh, and if I may react to that, is that when the US um, um, administration uh, and Trump, President Trump, um, um, made their tax reform, uh, after a long debate triggered by the best academics in the world, so I mentioned you, Michael, and their destination-based cash flow tax theory that the House of uh, the um, US Congress was convinced of and uh, kind of adapted, uh, adopted, uh, the Senate, probably wiser, senators are wiser, right, uh, decided to say, well, actually, we cannot go that far, but, but we need to broaden the base and the broadening of the base to introduce the famous guilty global intangible low tax income, which is kind of um, 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 a continuation of uh, what we started with action three, but in a more decisive uh, way. And when following the US tax reform, the conversation on pillar one and pillar two, pillar one being the uh, extension of uh, the action one, which uh, had not been successful either, just a report and then the agreement to work uh, onto uh, this until 2020. So when we resume that negotiation in particular to prevent countries from enacting uh, unilateral measures with um, relative success and relative uh, lack of uh, success, uh, there was a strong appetite from European countries in particular to try to um, draw on the uh, uh, guilty provision. And I uh, remember the Germans and the French uh, probably in that order saying, well, there is a new toy across the Atlantic, which is the guilty toy. We, we, we want to play with a similar toy. Uh, and they uh, asked for the conversation uh, to have two pillars, pillar one on the so-called tax challenges, the digitalization of the economy, and pillar two 
on uh, the uh, global minimum tax. When working on Pilot 2, and we issued the blueprint at the end of 2019, and actually all which was adopted um, um, uh, in October per the political deal, uh, October 21, was included in the blueprint. Um, um, so uh, this uh, blueprint uh, just showed the preference from European countries to move to a global minimum tax, but on a jurisdictional blending. That's how we call it. You uh, assess the um, tax differential, uh, not based uh, on the global average as per guilty, but on the jurisdictional basis, which removes uh, the um, uh, tax competition uh, entirely compared to a global average. When the uh, new US administration started uh, and under the leadership of ITAI uh, in terms of US delegation, uh, but also with the top priority from the president, which means a real top-down approach, we uh, negotiated throughout 2021 uh, this political agreement, which was reached on the 8th of October. Pivot 2 being um, um, absolutely critical, um, and uh, we know the agreement, so I guess you will spend a couple of hours describing it. So. Uh, I will just remind you of the fact that it's an effective tax rate of 15%, 1.5, which actually is a pretty high rate compared to what a number of commentators have said. Uh, it's an effective rate, that's why it's pretty high. Uh, there is a carve out, um, which is limited, but it starts at the level, which is not insignificant. 10% uh, uh, of the payroll, 8% uh, of the carrying value of the assets going down to 5% first five years, pretty flat, and then uh, going down uh, quite uh, steeply for the following uh, five years. Uh, we have the income inclusion rule, we have the under tax payment rule, we have uh, the top up tax. In addition to the globe rules, which I've just described, we have the subject to tax rule, which is extremely important as well, with probably the misperception by a number of observers and also uh, countries that uh, all this exercise was about uh, reinforcing the taxing right of the country of residence, where it is not only about the countries of residence, but also about uh, the uh, source countries. Since the agreement in October, We've worked uh, days and nights, literally, to be able to deliver the model rules because Pilot 2 is about countries enacting the rules on the unilateral manner uh, through domestic legislation, drawing on common rules. So the rules were adopted on the 30th of November. And I must say that they are not that easy to read, which is why we needed to come up with a commentary, which was issued a few weeks ago. All that to allow the EU uh, Commission to table a draft directive. Uh, I think it was on the 22nd of December. We are the day before this directive could be adopted in principle, or maybe it will be later on. We'll see what happens uh, tomorrow. But very significant progress already in March with almost a remnant then, so we can be reasonably optimistic whether tomorrow or on in not too long a distance, in spite of some elections taking place in the country uh, uh, which has currently the presidency of the European Union. Uh, the United States, I think, um, has clearly signaled that it's a priority of uh, this presidency. And uh, we hope that uh, the US Congress uh, will adopt uh, a reform of guilty, which would align it uh, with uh, the rules included uh, in um, the GLOBE uh, rules. But beyond these um, two important blocks, EU and US, uh, I would just like to mention a few countries which have indicated that uh, they will be moving. Um, and, and they are significant countries, I would say. Uh, you have uh, Switzerland, which announced that by the 1st of January 24, there will be a minimum tax in Switzerland uh, after a reform of the constitution. 
So, I mean, I can tell you, I've been through the end of bank secrecy in Switzerland, where they initially said it would take 10 years to change 10 tax treaties. Uh, here in uh, 18 months, they plan to change the constitution for this uh, to come into force whatsoever, whether the US implements or not, whether the European Union implements or not, which gives you a sense of, of the momentum and of uh, the direction which is taken. But I could I mean, name uh, Singapore, I could name uh, the United Arab Emirates introducing corporate income tax. I mean, you can see that this has quite a fundamental, um, um, represents quite a fundamental change, which brings me to one of your questions, and I will close with that, which is a critical mass. Because uh, pillar two is about countries moving unilaterally. But the real question is, is what's the impact if one country moves uh, um, uh, only? Or what's the impact if not all the countries move? Which is a question we we had from a number of journalists. Yeah, but what about Cayman Islands if, if the Cayman Islands uh, do not move? Well, it doesn't matter. What you need is enough countries which will implement the income inclusion rule, enough countries which will do the under tax payment rule. And that's, that's what I would call the critical mass. And we have very strong signal from the G7, from the G20, from developing countries as well, uh, from low tax jurisdictions with the top of tax, that you have this convergence towards um, uh, a critical mass, which will change the dynamic of uh, tax planning, which will change the dynamic of profit shifting. We think it's, we're coming to, to the end of it because the tax differential, again, 15% effective. So the tax differential will probably be too small to engage in very sophisticated planning. You do that when you have a difference of uh, at least 10, 15 points, when you have a difference of a few points, maybe you will not do it, noting that we should compare the 15% effective to the current, I don't know what's the rate, zero, one, two, three percent, and not to the domestic rate, which is a different story. L last thing, and food for thought, uh, because I didn't see that in your paper, um, uh, and, and uh, that's the question, it doesn't keep me awake at night, but I really, reflect on this, which is the impact on tax incentives in developing countries in particular, because developing countries said that Pillar 2 was not really their priority, was not really for them, while actually I tend to think that you have a volume of wasteful tax incentive. I can see Vicky Perry on the panel at some point, and Vicky worked on all that uh, when she was at the IMF. I think we're all convinced, World Bank, IMF, OECD, that they are I mean, a, a big chunk of wasteful tax incentives, which actually could be neutralized uh, at source by putting um, an end um, to them, which would bring significant revenue uh, to developing countries. Overall, the impact assessment uh, that we've uh, made, but uh, that is echoed by a number of uh, independent impact assessments, is that uh, pillar two, should bring up to $150 billion annually uh, to government. Uh, it's not anecdotal, we're just talking about uh, corporate income tax, which is not the tax bringing, yielding the, more, uh, the most revenue across countries, but that's uh, something significant. Last word, and I promise I close with that, uh, Michael. I think if we look backwards uh, in the long-term history, We've moved from um, um, an economy where you had local sovereignty, borders, countries, which, which could assess their taxes with limited frictions, to um, an era of 30, 40 years where borders disappeared, com companies could uh, plan extremely aggressively, CFC legislations didn't uh, work any longer, to a new era where we have some form of regulation. It's not only about collecting more taxes, uh, it's about ensuring that globalization is not rejected by the people who have to bear the cost of, of, of COVID, the cost of public expenditure, uh, and who feel like uh, they have, uh, they are overburdened because some big players able to play internationally are not subject to them. We'll have to make sure that together with this regulation, we do have 
the proper elimination of global taxation, we do have a framework which we are now working on, which will ensure a proper articulation among these different legislations. And we are confident that we can achieve that goal. On that note, I stop. Thank you, Michael, for the invitation. Great. Thank you very much for that introduction to the conference, Pascal. Are you, you're happy to take a question or two? Are you? Um, I hope depending on the question you can depending on the question <laughs> I, I would invite so we have a, a very large number of participants on this in this conference at the moment nearly 400 we you can't all ask a question I'm afraid but if you type the question into the question and answer um, box I will um, see how many of them I can ask Pascal and while you're thinking about that let me um, find a question on my own which is I'm um, just I'd like to just come back to the you know the incredible achievement that you have uh, achieved of getting so many countries to agree and I, I guess you know, something which we've been puzzling about is you know what are the what are the aims and objectives of pillar two and I guess we keep we keep going between the kind of profit shifting aim to combat profit shifting and the aim to combat tax competition and we've we've done like analysis of previous OECD documents is a bit like but biblical scholarship we kind of go through that and see if we can kind of identify one or the other I mean, is it is it fair to say that overall this is you know some compromise between um, countries which are more keen on profit shifting and countries which are more keen on uh, combating tax competition, or is that not 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 reasonable? I'm not sure I would phrase it that way. Okay. Um, I I'd rather think that uh, this is a pretty aggressive approach from countries which have considered that they were losing too much out of uh, and less tax competition. Um, so that's why the level of ambition is high. And uh, what we're coming up with is, is, is pretty demanding. Uh, so not really a compromise between Germany and Singapore to take too extreme. I, I wouldn't describe it like that because I think that would not be fair. Uh, instead, you have, I think, the achievement of, of yes, maybe a couple of decades, if not, if not more, of work. It started in the mid-90s, if you remember well, with a firm on harmful tax practices. I mean, talking about tax competition, that time was taboo. Uh, so we use the word uh, harmful tax practices. And, and, and I think, as is a bit the case with BEPS, the, the outcome was not the one expected. At that time, I think when we started when they started, I was not there, in 1996, uh, you had uh, some ring fence regime, uh, the Dock of Dublin, for instance. And we said, no, you cannot ring fence. It, it, it must be for all. So you cannot attract mobile capital without giving it to your own companies. And, and, and the end result was Ireland lowering its uh, general corporate income tax rate with, with a number of of tools to actually reduce further and down to an extremely low level of effective taxation. But, but the first attempts to regulate tax competition resulted in fiercer tax competition. One has criticized the BEPS uh, work on transfer pricing when our goal was to realign the location of the profits with the location of the activities that actually in some cases some companies reallocated the activities to where the profits were, which was not really the goal. And I think the work uh, you did on, on destination-based cash flow tax and, and all the reflection on, on how you would limit the profit shifting by realizing that, and here I'm talking about pillar one, it's by anchoring the profit in the country where the clients, where the customers are, because the customers are the only thing that a company cannot really shift. Uh, you can shift your assets, you can shift your factories, you can shift your employees, uh, you can shift your profit, obviously, you can shift your patents, but, but your clients, your customers, you cannot really, really shift. So you have that dimension, but together with Pillar 2, with putting a floor to tax competition. It's not eliminating tax competition, it's putting a floor, recognizing, by the way, substance, and that's the carve out, uh, very limited, 5% of the assets and the payroll in 10 years time with a transition period. But both um, uh, together, I think, reflect more the fact that the large taxing countries told the smaller countries, 
the system is no longer sustainable. And if we don't want to go back to a system where we'll have to put in place withholding taxes to reestablish borders everywhere, I mean, the, alter, the counterfactual to Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 together with BEPS, uh, and, and one could add the uh, automatic exchange of information, the, the, the counterfactual was back to aggressive sovereignties with um, shutting down the, the borders uh, and not organizing a cooperation. So either you go for cooperation, articulating uh, new rules, which are domestic rules, like the hybrid mismatches, uh, or the uh, limitation of interest deductibility, which is a new set of international rules. They are domestic legislation, but based on something international, together with fixing the um, uh, fault, the, the defaults of international instruments like transfer pricing or, or tax treaties. So all that with the new allocation rules, I think reflect a new balance of the international system. The goal is to stabilize the international tax system. I better say it before it die because he will repeat it again and again. The goal is to stabilize the international system in a cooperative manner. Otherwise, you have no stability and aggressive unilateral measures. Uh, so I think that was the alternative, which makes me think that the outcome is not a compromise between no tax jurisdictions and high tax jurisdictions. Okay, thanks. Um, I have the, uh, quite a few questions have come in on the Q&A. Uh, let me, can I ask you two questions at once here? One is, um, there's a few people have asked about the link between pillar one and pillar two, and uh, the extent to which they're still a package deal. Um, and then there's also a question um, about whether tax competition is going to be limited or really over, or will it change form? And the suggestion here is that low tax countries can adopt QT QDMTTs, and then refund the money through grants and refundable credits. So can I can I put both of those to you? Sorry, I had, both on mute, my, so. I had to unmute myself. So Pillar 1 and, and, and Pillar 2 are coming together, but clearly the um, uh, implementation is not the same. One requires a multilateral convention, the other requires domestic legislation. The timeline is not exactly the same. Pillow 2 rules are uh, now uh, ready um, and uh, countries can move. And the, the last difference, which is extremely important, is that the critical mass is not the same. We'll be working on the critical mass for Pillow 1. It's a part of the detailed implementation plan. And I think the political agreement of the 8th of October, the critical mass of, of I mean, Pillow, Pillow 2 is not what we call in our jargon, a minimum standard. So countries can move ahead on their own. What matters in, in terms of impact is to have the critical mass of countries. And, and we think we're having it. So Pillow 2 is, is happening whatsoever. Uh, whether Pillar 1 is, is implemented or not, but Pillar 1 is being developed, is moving ahead, uh, right? Uh, uh, it's just that the pace is, is not uh, exactly the same. Now, the, the, the second question is almost amusing. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I read that uh, in the papers that your researchers are doing. I mean, I, I love paradoxes. Uh, it's Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a French philosopher, who said, I prefer to be a, a, a man of uh, paradoxes than a man of prejudices. So I love paradoxes, but, but, but still at some point, the, the paradox is, is funny, but becomes actually too funny. I mean, thinking that pivot two is a way to organize tax competition. I mean, let, let me laugh, it's, it's rather the opposite. We were in a world where tax competition resulted in some effective tax rate for multinational companies close to zero. And it's lasted for decades. We're putting an end to that. We are making sure that you have a safety net. Now, of course, and you may get into more technical details about uh, the income inclusion rule or the, the under tax payment rule and the tax adjustment or no tax adjustment and the top up tax uh, with no tax adjustment, what the consequences are and so, but, but frankly speaking, I mean, having jurisdictions which so far did not tax, introducing a minimum tax of 15% effective. Is, is that the conception of people to say, oh, that is organizing tax competition? No, it is not. It's putting a flaw to that. It will not result in countries 
being pressured to level their um, uh, tax um, uh, revenue down, rather the opposite. I'm not saying that will increase the, the tax rate, but it's not a pressure down. It's putting an end to the pressure down to corporate income tax, not the other way around. Uh, so I, I think um, by being too sophisticated, sometimes some, some reasoning end up with something a bit absurd. And, and that's my response, uh, a bit provocative response, but to a provocative question, right? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I have one more provocative question here, which um, which is it's about the, the role of the arms length principle. So I guess this is saying, you know, the pillar one and pillar two are both moving in different directions away from the arms length principle, perhaps. And, you know, what do you think is the future of the arms length principle in the international tax framework? I knew we had to talk about God uh, during that conversation. Yeah. So uh, yeah. we've, we've started the conversation. So. I, 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 and, and you know that sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm a bit uh, too talkative about uh, that, that God. Actually, what you see is that it, it's not black and white or, or, or arm's length uh, and versus uh, the world is collapsing. It, it's been years that we've seen some, some uh, nuances brought to the arm's length, not on the uh, Article 9 of the Model Tax Convention itself, but the introduction of some new international tax rules like interest deductibility limitation, which is based on some form of formula, right? Uh, pillar one, which is based on some form of formula. Uh, pillar two, which is based on financial accounts like pillar one. You can see that all that brings some nuances, uh, doesn't replace the arms length principle, which by the way, works for most of the transactions, maybe not most of the profit. And what we're trying to do is to cope with this reality. A complete shift to a pure destination-based cash flow tax did not happen. I don't see this happening, Michael, but, but maybe I'm wrong and maybe you will be more successful uh, um, uh, bringing more than 137 countries. That's the record for the time being. So you can try to do best, but, but I don't see this happening. So I see a more nuanced picture uh, where uh, we have the arms length principle, but we also recognize that for pillar one, in some limited circumstances, but impactful circumstances, we'll move to unitary taxation, and where we have introduced some new international rules based more on formulas than on uh, transactions, um, uh, transaction-based uh, uh, pricing methods. Uh, so it's not uh, black or white, uh, it's nuanced. And, and I think that's the only way to move forward. Okay, uh, thank you very much. These are great answers. I, um, we, we're a bit short of time. Let me just, I'm, if I may, I just, I, mean, I think one day we should um, make you stay here for several hours to answer all these questions that are coming in. but. Today, uh, let me just try one more, which is um, about the challenges of using financial accounting income for pillar one and pillar two. I mean, do you, do, to what extent do you feel that's uh, problematic or has, has any kind of issues that we need to think about? Uh, if it were problematic, we wouldn't have proposed that. So it's more a solution than a problem, which I think is there. And that's something very significant, uh, I think. I, I would not comment further because I, I, I would be too, uh, too talkative about that. But I think it's a fundamental change, uh, which probably had not been noted as much as it should have been. I mean, you know that the European Union has tried to build the CCC, I don't know how many Cs, TB uh, for, for years, which was about a common consolidated tax base. And, and here, I think you have something which uh, uh, ensures uh, worldwide, some form of common tax base, uh, removing some of the problematic issue of pure account tax accounting stuff. Uh, so that's uh, definitely a good question for another two hour session uh, in a few months, Michael. Okay, well, we may invite you back for that one. Uh, Pascal, congratulations on where you've uh, led the world so far. And, um, you know, I congratulate, um, you know, best wishes for the future and how it goes from here. So thank you very much for joining us. This thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. And um, today we're going to move straight on to Itai Grinberg, who 
uh, hopefully will reveal himself any moment if he's, Itai, are you there? Yes, they only just let me go onto the video. Excellent. So, so, so I've now been permitted uh, <laughs> by the August organizers to be seen. So thank you. <laughs> right, sorry about that. So um, as I, you know, Itai has been leading the negotiations for the US and uh, is an old friend from his previous life when he was an academic and a professor of law. So Itai, the floor is yours. Um, so uh, first, um, you know, thank you um, uh, very much to, to Mike and to the center for um, giving me uh, this opportunity to say a few words about Pillar 2. Uh, I really do appreciate the opportunity to be speaking again in this setting um, that's so familiar to me from my days in an academic role. Um, I've always enjoyed being part of the center's events. Uh, and even while I presently wear a non-academic hat, um, Itai Grunberg 2, as the US Treasury chose to name me in my email address, uh, I hope we'll all get to um, uh, be in person um, again one day soon. Um, but now uh, let me turn to the uh, substance. Uh, as you all know, as we just talked about, uh, in a remarkable testimony to multilateralism, last year 137 jurisdictions uh, in the OECD inclusive framework agreed to a global minimum tax, as well as to a partial reallocation of certain taxing rights from countries where companies are headquartered to those where they sell goods and services. Um, the agreement ultimately included all G20 and EU countries representing nearly 95% of the world's GDP. And of course, as Mike went through, the advertisement for this program sets out the magnitude of what the accomplishment can be in a way I would agree with. A once in a generation accomplishment for economic diplomacy um, that is arguably the most significant international economic pact of the 21st century so far. So why is it that big a deal? And what path does it put us on? Why do we need to implement? And equally importantly, what path does it take us off at the 30,000 foot level? Well, first, the Biden-Harris administration came into office wishing to end the race to the bottom over multinational corporate taxation and level the corporate tax playing field for US and non-US headquartered MNCs alike. And as Pascal recollected, that was after the US was the first country in the world to adopt um, a minimum tax on the foreign earnings of foreign subsidiaries of US MNCs via the guilty regime. Uh, Secretary Yellen made um, these points as early as her confirmation hearing. And the deal does what we set out to do. It will ensure that both US and foreign headquartered multinational corporations face a common level of minimum taxation, thereby ending the race to the bottom in corporate taxation. The agreement overcomes the collective action problem we've had on this issue for the last 30 plus years. And by leveling the playing field, it also meets the single most frequently heard international tax policy request made by the US multinational business community over my entire career in tax. Second, in doing this through an architecture that asks multinational corporations to pay modestly more, rather than allowing them to pay less and less, as the world has been in effect doing for the last 30 plus years, the deal importantly achieves the objectives in a win-win way, a more level playing field for business that improves equity for working and middle-class people at the same time. And the deal also thereby helps stabilize not only the international tax architecture, I'm laughing that Pascal said I would say the word stabilize often, uh, but the international economic architecture more broadly um, through a uh, revival of international economic multilateralism, a fair tax system, and new guardrails against tit for tat trade funds. So why did we want to achieve all of that? Why did the US government decide to dedicate not just tax policy, but other resources to those goals? Importantly, for both international corporate tax policy and broader foreign policy reasons. That is why and how we achieved an all of government commitment to these negotiations. Now, this is clearly a tax policy audience and that's the audience I love. But I, I wanted to take this opportunity to start with the broader frame for why the Biden administration believes that this deal is more than just good tax policy that helped make the international corporate tax system fit for purpose in the 21st century. This US administration believes that by ensuring that capital and corporations pay their fair share, this deal is part of what it means to have a foreign policy for the middle class. 
we want to establish a tax architecture in which countries work together towards more equitable growth, innovation, and prosperity, while having a better basis on which to fund critical national priorities. And in contrast, we don't want an environment where incentive compatibility incentivizes all out tax competition. Why? Well, in part because we believe that creating fairness for working and middle class people is important for the continued success of a fair and free global economy. And at the end of the G7 meetings in London, less than a year ago, you heard Secretary Yellen say that she believed through the international tax negotiations we were seeing a revival of international economic multilateralism and cooperation, starting first with our historic G7 partners. And forgive me since I'm speaking at an Oxford event, but standing and residing in Washington, um, which is one of the many places, perhaps Oxford is not one of them, where, where people can all too quickly forget the immediate past. So join me and think back on what was happening right before and as the Biden-Harris administration came into office. At a time that every developed nation was facing inequities brought on by dramatic technological change, the surging market power of the largest and most profitable corporations, and fierce competitive pressures resulting from true global capital mobility, COVID happened. The pandemic was the latest event where large globally engaged multinational corporations seemed to do much better than individuals lower on the economic ladder and small and medium-sized businesses. So with COVID as just the most recent inequality generating event, let me ask you to reflect on some bigger picture questions that were and are at stake, even from a business perspective, let alone from the perspective of ordinary um, men and women. Could globally engaged multinational business succeed if economic populism and protectionism were to become the order of the political day? How should we successfully reconcile the very substantial benefits of a free and open global economy with the increasing dissatisfaction of working and middle class people across the developed economies with a system supported by democratic governments that they have increasingly felt is failing to deliver for their needs? And symbols matter, and the corporate income tax, completely independent of its contributions from a public finance perspective, is an important and sometimes critical symbol of political concern with the distributive outcomes in a market system. And look, I serve in an administration that held a summit for democracy last year, because we thought that was what was needed. Because as President Biden then said, strengthening our democratic institutions requires constant effort and around the world, we have seen sustained and alarming challenges to democracy, not just from without, but from within. And in terms of academic insight, over a couple of generations, a wide variety of economic historians, sociologists, and political scientists have all been influenced by the idea that transparent taxation of mobile assets and capital generally tends to produce more representative government. And relatedly, Addressing concerns that business pays its fair share is a necessary part of keeping economies open because public support for growth inducing policies and uh, limits on um, economic populism depend in part on that belief. And my experience in this role has suggested that when one steps up to conversation at CEO level, at the tax rates described by the global minimum tax at least, you hear business leaders express support for those types of policies too. And that makes sense, since arguably no institutions are more invested in keeping economies open and free than our multinational corporations. And importantly, the corporate tax is an important component of the effort to keep income tax systems appropriately progressive and make sure that owners of capital bear their fair share of the tax burden. And so that is, to my mind, the geopolitical and geoeconomic frame, which then gets us to the public finance. And there, first, I can say that the US Treasury very much appreciates the Center for Business Taxation's interest in and analysis of Pillar 2 from a public finance lens. And I would also say that I'm frustrated that your good public finance work is being mischaracterized. 
for instance, there are those who seem to have read the center to be saying that pillar two incentivizes countries to eliminate corporate income taxation entirely. When I believe the point has been that some countries that previously would have been incentivized to eliminate corporate income taxation entirely or already did not have corporate income taxes may now be incentivized to adopt a qualified domestic minimum top up tax. And that way of thinking stems from similar intellectual streams to those that led to the Biden-Harris administration's proposal to eliminate QBI in guilty. Even as we have shown ourselves willing to compromise at home and abroad to find middle ground to achieve the goal of ending the race to the bottom. In any case, as someone who has drafted letters that in part had to respond to mischaracterizations of the center's work, I would urge your authors to speak up when their work is being mischaracterized. And as a once in future academic, I would point out that unless you do that, good public finance research can end up being counterproductive. So with that put aside, let me frame the public finance analysis the way I see it, in part by quoting the center's own scholars to both describe the problem and frame what has been accomplished as the solution. So eight years ago, some of the participants on the panels uh, wrote that the corporate international tax system as it existed before Pillar 2 encouraged, quote, countries to compete with one another in a manner which destabilizes the system itself. Countries compete to attract economic activity and to favor domestic companies, which for at least 30 years has led to gradual reductions in effective rates of taxation of profit. And um, uh, compare that with the most recent writing from the center, which recognizes that pillar two for the first time in history places a meaningful floor on the race to the bottom in corporate taxation, understood as the amount of income tax corporations pay in countries where they're operating, whether under a corporate income tax without the substance-based carve-out rules agreed for purposes of the IIR and QDMTT or with such rules in place. For instance, the center has pointed out that pillar two changes the choice set by ensuring that a country can introduce a QD MTT in the quote safe knowledge that this would not impinge on its competitive position because the top up tax would be collected by another country if it's not collected through the QD MTT. And importantly, the QD MTT speaks to just a relatively limited subset of companies and countries have incentives to have a broader corporate income tax for all sorts of reasons. And to use non QD MTT rules to do so and are unlikely to exempt the biggest companies from those non-QDMTT rules. In other words, a key feature of Pillar 2, as now structured, is to create incentive compatibility for a meaningful corporate tax, at least once a critical mass of countries adopts the regime, which is to say that um, it will eliminate the incentives for countries to compete with each other to undermine the system. Rather, countries have strong incentives to join the system, and as an uh, illustrious group of writers wrote a few years ago in a book that uh, Mike um, decided to uh, uh, publicize in his opening remarks, um, uh, incentive compatibility is important for creating stability and stability reduces uncertainty and thereby supports investment and growth. That's in the context of a pillar two system that's robust against avoidance including reducing incentives for profit shifting, and in the context of the existing profit allocation system, reduces incentives for tax-driven location of production and headquarters activities, thereby improving efficiency in addition to fairness. And Pillar 2 does all of that while both necessarily limiting itself to tax and keeping open the path for important Pagubian subsidies, even when those are run through the tax system itself. So for example, we in the US are mindful of the need to move efficiently towards a green energy world. And you've seen the administration propose and the House of Representatives pass direct pay provisions that run through the tax system and are, happen and are pillar two competitive consistent too. Now, this is an event focused on pillar two. And accordingly, I've uh, focused mostly on pillar two in my remarks. 
But let me just note that the two-pillar solution also includes pillar one, and the U.S. is also deeply committed to and helping lead the negotiations of pillar one, which similarly seeks stability, and in the case of pillar one, stability in parts of the international tax system that have frankly been deeply upended over the last 15 years, during which um, the current system for allocating taxing rights simply lost the support of many sovereigns. The audience will recall that the prior U.S. administration's Office of Tax Policy decided to acknowledge that there was a problem with the international taxing rights allocation system writ large, having concluded that the prior view that it was just Beth's issue was not quite right. But they strongly and correctly emphasizes that, emphasized that any issues were not limited to the digital economy, and not only because the entire economy was digitalizing. At the same time, political pressures abroad began creating a pretty chaotic array of digital services taxes and other unilateral measures. Those discriminated against U.S. business, and they threatened them with multiple layers of taxation, and we were escalating um, tax-related trade tensions that could harm economic growth. Nevertheless, when we inherited the OECD G20 negotiations, all of this was on life support. Moreover, there were signs that unilateral measures were threatening to expand beyond digital services. Then, via an extraordinary and sustained effort in the early months of the administration, an extraordinary effort for Pillar 1 that was paralleled only by what was done on Pillar 2, the United States brought the negotiations back, moved um, uh, past conceptually indefensible scoping proposals for Pillar 1, and revitalized the promise of um, a deal that um, could create a sustainable system and avoid a chaotic, the chaotic environment that might otherwise um, have arisen and could have been characterized by unilateral measures that not only constitute awful tax policy, but could put free trade at risk via discriminatory taxes that unduly burden U.S. commerce. So um, let me just close with a final observation about the broader significance of this deal in the context of our community of international tax specialists. Before the financial crisis, when I got into international, tax, into international tax, there was almost no general public awareness of international tax law. The idea that leading politicians would attempt to comprehensively address the multilateral dimension of international tax affairs as a meaningful political gesture that their publics would appreciate was just not on the horizon. In contrast, at the G7 in London last May, Chancellor Sunak heartfully praised the international tax agreement reached on corporate taxation to his finance minister colleagues in the highest profile session of that G7, which was dedicated to international tax alone, because he said it would be the meaningful thing the public would understand about why we have G7 meetings. That's how far we've come politically in international tax. So I think the moment has arrived for all of us in the tax community to try to live up to that challenge. We should build the international tax part of an international economic architecture that's stable and meaningful and fair and fit for purpose in the 21st century, keeping in mind not just the public finance lens, but the broader lens. And I hope we can all contribute and help the world do that in our particular international tax kind of way. Um, so thank you again for giving me the opportunity to be virtually with you all. Uh, I very much really do look forward to the day when I can again be with you in person and participate in the ways um, I used to do at these sessions uh, in days gone by. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Itai. That's a uh, very helpful contribution. Thank you for your um, contribution to this agreement. I think if we look back to, you know, the months just before the, the Biden administration taking over, there was a bit of a hiatus waiting for, you know, to see what the US position would be on these issues. And that's be that became very clear, uh, you know, as soon, a few months into the Biden administration, and you were clearly a big part of that uh, in creating that, that message, that direction of reform, which was, you know, then uh,
taken on by Pascal and, and other members of the OCD and other member and the other 137 countries. So uh, congratulations on the work you've done outside academia, though we are still looking forward to you returning to us in due course. And talking about coming in person, we hope to have another conference along these lines at the beginning of July, and um, we are hoping that that might be in person. So that's a general advert to look out for that in the future. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, we decided not to take questions at this point, so we're going to move straight on to our presentations of the research which Itai has already cited and um, from yeah. the center. So thank you, uh, Itai and, and Pascal, who's still there, came on briefly. I, I don't know whether Pascal showed his, his face because he wanted to say something or... No, okay. Thank no. you, Itai, very no, much. Good, good to see you and thanks for the invitation, Michael. Have a good conference. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you. Thank Itza. you very much. I'm sorry I have to go. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, we're now moving on to the second part of the conference then. Uh, and that is a bit of a change of scene. We are going to uh, have presentations by four of uh, the Center for Business Taxation Researchers. We've been doing a great deal of work on both Pillars 1 and Pillar 2. And we would like to present some of it to you. So Actually, let me invite all, all of the speakers of this part to, to come on screen if they would like to. Um, these presentations are going to reflect the inter, interdisciplinary nature of the research program of the centre. We have the first two presentations are by lawyers, the second two presentations are by economists. Um, it's going to start with John Vella, Professor of Law in Oxford University and Deputy Director of the, of the centre. He's going to review the aims and objectives of Pillar 2 and then focus particularly on the impact of tax competition along the lines of uh, what Pascal and Itai have, have both been talking about. We're then going to move on to Hayden Wardle Burroughs, who's also a researcher at the Centre for Business Taxation, having previously worked in uh, practice and also as a member of Australia's delegation to the OECD in, in the negotiations and discussions on Pillar 2. And he's going to look further at some aspects of competition, including the role of qualified refundable tax credits, which we mentioned just a moment ago, and also timing differences. Then we will have Irem Gucheri. Uh, and, uh, until recently, Irem was also senior research fellow in the centre. She's now moved on to a position as associate professor in economics and public policy at the Brevagnet School of Government in Oxford. Um, she's going to talk about the work that we've been doing on both the, on the impact of Pillar 2, both on profit shifting and on economic efficiency. And last but not least, we have Martin Zimmer, who is also a senior research fellow in the centre. And he's going to uh, present some work we've been doing using macroeconomic data to look at a number of issues. You know, one is uh, the extent to which um, Pillar 2 can get a critical mass. And second, the, the relative size of the substance-based income inclusion. So those are the four presentations. That will take about an hour with questions. So I will invite you to uh, write questions again in Q&A. And I think what we will do though is, is have the four presentations and then have questions after those. So that's the plan. And so in that point, I will hand over directly to John who is gonna make a start. Okay, thanks, Mike. And um, whilst I share my screen, I'll, I'll apologize for, to everyone for being a bit informal in my attire, but I, I flew to Vienna last Friday and my luggage is still somewhere uh, lost in Heathrow at Heathrow Airport. Um, okay, so um, I'll be addressing the issue of um, Pillar 2's impact on, on uh, tax competition. And as Mike said, uh, Mike, uh, Hayden and myself have been um, thinking about this question, you know, to what extent and how does Pillar 2 impact uh, tax competition? And we, we wrote a policy brief um, last January, which is available on our website and on SSRN, and which Pascal and um, it I mentioned earlier because it has been partly misrepresented perhaps in some, uh, in some quarters, and I'll explain in what way and, and, and why later on in my presentation. Uh, but since then, we've been expanding this policy brief. Uh, we expanded it quite substantially and extended it quite substantially. So, um, and the outcome of that will be a working paper, which we should be able to share um, in the coming days. But essentially, I think the, um, our headline conclusion on the impact of Pillar 2 on tax competition is that uh, Pillar 2 will have an impact on tax competition. But 
it might be um, not as straightforward as one might think, and perhaps um, less or certainly less straightforward than some politicians have uh, made it out uh, to be. But, you know, in a way, we shouldn't be too surprised about that because, um, you know, I know Pascal pushed back against this earlier, but, you know, I do think Pillar 2 is a bit of a political compromise because, as we know, uh, countries were divided in their view on what Pillar 2 should do. So some country, and this actually comes out of the inclusive framework documentation, if you go back to it. So, you know, there was a tension among countries, you know, some countries wanted Pillar 2 to address tax competition quite fully. Um, whilst other countries wanted or were in favor of a less ambitious pillar two and a pillar two which essentially focused on profit shifting. Now, what's interesting is that if pillar two were of this less ambitious, narrower form that just addressed profit shifting, it would essentially pick up where uh, BEPS left off uh, with the final report in 2015. And it would also follow on on the principles which were agreed by countries in the BEPS process. Now, I'll just remind you that one of the principles agreed in the BEPS process was that no or low taxation is not per se a cause of concern, but it becomes so when it is associated with practices that artificially segregate taxable income from the activities that generate it. Therefore, if we, if we went for a narrow pillar two, a pillar two that just looked at, uh, just addressed profit shifting, we would be following this, this uh, policy. Therefore, we'd be saying that, you know, we shouldn't really look at under taxed income. Uh, we shouldn't address under taxed income unless it arose in a country different to that where the activities generating the income uh, take place. On the other hand, it will go for the more ambitious tax uh, profit uh, pillar two, therefore a pillar two that also addressed tax competition, then we'd have to depart from this principle which was agreed during BEPS. And therefore, if uh, pillar two was to address tax competition, then we would be saying no or low taxation is now deemed to be per se a cause of concern. And therefore under taxed income, should be addressed even if it arises in the same country where the activities generating that income will take place. Okay, so there's this broad, um, you know, disagreement among countries as to whether to have a narrow pillar two or a more ambitious pillar two that address tax competition more fully. And my take is that what we end up with is a political compromise. Therefore, we have a global minimum tax but we also have uh, a limited formulaic substance-based carve-out, what was called substance-based carve-out, and is now uh, known as the substance-based income exclusion. Okay, so what I'd like to do is to um, actually run you through two of the uh, headline conclusions we reached in our work on, on the impact of pillar two on tax competition. But before doing so, it's useful to remind ourselves on how the top-up tax calculation um, is, is done. And it's essentially done in three steps. So the first step is to calculate the effective tax rate. And we do that by defining adjusted covered taxes by the adjusted globe income. Therefore, if you have a hundred of tax in a, in a jurisdiction and a thousand of income, that gives you an effective tax rate of 10%, for example. Right, so that's the first step. We figure out what the effective tax rate is. Then the top up rate is 15% minus the ETR. Therefore, if the ETR is 10, as it was in my example, then we'd have a top up rate of uh, 5%. Now, once we have the top up rate, we can therefore find, then we can then find what the uh, top up tax liability is. And to explain that, I'd, I'll I'll, I'll first focus on the black bit, which is the, which is the bit we had um, until the model uh, rules were published in December, uh, last December, so December 2021. So we essentially multiply excess profit, which is defined as adjusted globe income, less SBIE, less carve out. So we take excess profit, which is income, less the carve out, and we multiply that by the top up rate. Okay, so we had a thousand of income and 500 of carve out that gives us excess profit of 500. If the top up rate is 5%, we apply 5% of 500, that is the top up tax due. And that can be collected by countries 
through the IIR, the income inclusion rule, let's say the country of the parent entity can collect that through the IIR, or failing that, it can be collected by some other country or a number of countries through the UTPR. So that's the position um, as, it, as we understood it, at least till the model rules were published last December. But the model rules also introduced this term in the equation, which is the qualified domestic minimum top-up tax, the QDMTT. And, you know, so the QDMTT wasn't discussed as far as I'm aware in any public documentation, uh, but it really has a very significant impact on Pileto. It has a very significant impact on the distributional um, consequences of Pileto, and it has a significant impact on the impact of Pileto on tax competition. So it's really a very significant addition um, to, to the Pileto framework. But what it does essentially is it bumps up uh, source countries to the front of the queue. And this, in a way, uh, goes back to what Pascal was saying earlier, that Pileto shouldn't be understood as uh, reinforcing residence-based taxation, especially with the QDMTT. It becomes quite clear that what you get with uh, Pilatu and the QDMTT is in a way you're reinforcing source-based taxation. So Pilatu, sorry, the QDMTT allows the source, the source country to um, jump right to the front of the queue. In other words, if there's a top-up tax, um, you know, um, the source country can come in and collect it through the QDMTT rather than allow another country to collect it through the IAR or through the UTPR. And the one immediate conclusion we can reach then is that countries have a pretty strong incentive to introduce a QDMTT, even if their tax rate is comfortably above 15%. Why? Because if there is any other, if there is for some reason a, a company happens to have an ETR which falls below um, the 15% minimum rate, then there's a top up tax due and rather than have another country collect the tax, the QDMTT allows the source country to collect the tax. And importantly, by adopting a QDMTT, a country does not worsen its competitive position, right? Because the tax would have been collected by another country anyway. So a strong incentive for countries to adopt the QDMTT. Okay, so what are, uh, I said I'm going to talk about two headline conclusions we reached. And the first one is that in fact, the pillar two does um, create a floor on tax competition among source countries. Uh, equal to 15% of excess profit, right? So that's the one of the big uh, headline conclusions we reached. So there is a floor on total tax collected by source countries equal to 15% of excess profit. Now that conclusion is subject to qualification uh, because as Hayden will, describe, will explain later on, there are competition channels that countries may choose to pursue, which allows them to break through this floor and therefore allow multinationals to pay less than 15% of excess profit through grants or through the qualified refundable tax credits, but I'll leave that to Hayden. So there is, you know, yes, a floor is created, um, but subject to, the, subject to the comments which Hayden will make later on. Now it's in the interesting percept, perhaps as a matter of history uh, at, this at this point in time, but the QDMTT actually did make uh, a significant difference here. The QDMTT significantly alters pillar two's impact on tax competition. Why? Because if we had the pillar two without the QDMTT, pillar two would, ensure, would have ensured that multinationals pay a minimum level of tax equal to 15% of excess profit. But Pillar 2 would not have placed a floor on competition among source countries. Why? Because source countries would still have had an incentive to reduce their corporation tax. But as I said, countries with the QDMTT now have an incentive to collect at least 15% of excess profit through the QDMTT, and therefore that is the floor. So if the current floor, ignoring negative taxes, is set at zero on corporation tax, now the floor is corporation tax at zero plus 15% excess pro, uh, um, a QDMTT of, of at least 15% of excess profit. Now, just to be clear, and this is uh, an important point, I think, is that pillar two does not create an incentive for countries to increase their CIT rate to 15%. Now they may do so for whatever reason, but you know, the incentive is not to create 
to increase your CIT rate to 15%. Because the floor, as I said, is not 15% of the corporate tax base. The floor is 15% of excess profit through the, collected through the QDMTT. Therefore, the floor is not 15% corporation tax on a, with a corporate tax base. It's also not 15% of the globe tax base. And perhaps counterintuitively in a way, it's even not 15% of excess profit. Therefore, if a country simply narrow its tax, so increased its tax rate to 15% and adopted excess profit as its tax base, uh, there would still be a top-up tax deal. Um, there would still be an IIR deal because of the um, because fifteen percent of excess profit will, is less will bring it less than fifteen percent um, of profit, of course. So therefore, that still be the ETR would be below fifteen percent in the first step of our calculation. Okay, so that's the first um, that's the first uh, headline conclusion we reach. That subject to what Hayden will say, we do have um, we do have a floor on tax competition among source countries as a result of Peleto. Now, perhaps the more controversial bit is the one that it I mentioned um, earlier on that was misunderstood in some quarters. So I'll, I'll explain it uh, carefully. Um, so pillar two creates an incentive for perhaps it intensifies, it strengthens the incentive for countries to reduce their corporation tax, even if they may end up collecting the same amount of tax uh, through the QDMTT. And to explain this, uh, it's easiest to use a simple example. Now, I know this example is, is, is very simple and I know that you know, the real world is more complicated, but hopefully this will just show you the kind of incentives uh, we're thinking about here. So in this example, country Y and country X are competing for uh, investment from a multinational and the investment will gen generate 1,200 in pre-tax income if it's undertaken in country Y, but if it's undertaken in country X, it only generates 1,000 of pre-tax income. Now, if the corporate tax rate in country Y is 25%, that leaves the multinational with an after-tax income of 900, right? Because you have a tax liability of 300, which leaves you with an after-tax income of 900. Now, in the absence of pillar two, that's the third column here, in the absence of pillar two, for country X to offer the same after-tax income to the multinational, and therefore to be able to compete for the investment with country Y, country X would have to offer a tax rate of 10%, right? So this is in the absence of pillar two. Why? Because in that case, the tax liability in country X would be 100, which leaves the, which leaves the multinational with after-tax income of 900. Now, this is the main point, which, um, uh, you know, we, we, this is where the important bit comes. If country X were to keep the same tax rate as it had pre-pillar two, post-pillar two, country X would not be able, would, would offer, um, the multinational would earn a lower after-tax income it invests in country X than it invested in country Y. And therefore, what that means is that to offer, to, to retain its competitive position, not to improve its competitive position, just to retain its competitive position, country X would have to reduce its corporate tax rate and collect more tax through the QDMTT. So that's the claim we make. It, it might be a, a quirk of the system, but it, it certainly works out like this when you go through the details. So if country X were to keep a 10% uh, tax rate, uh, and here we're assuming that the SBIE and therefore excess profit is 500, there would be a CIT liability of 100, but there also would be a QDMTT of 25, that is 15 minus 10 gives us 5% top up rate multiplied by the uh, excess profit of 500, it gives us 25, therefore total tax liability in country X of 125 and the after tax income of 875. Therefore, country X would need to lower its tax rate because if it keeps it at 10%, the after-tax income would be lower than that, that the multinational could earn in country Y. And it would have to lower it to achieve the same after-tax income. It basically would have to lower it to 5%, which, um, you know, it's true that the, the country X would collect the difference through the, um, 
through the QDMTT, but it still would have to go through this process of reducing its corporate tax rate and collecting the corporate tax, uh, sorry, to collect uh, the tax through the QDMTT too. And th then it would achieve the same after tax income as it had uh, pre pillar two. So those are the two headline conclusions, uh, two of the headline conclusions we reached. One, a floor is achieved on, is established on tax competition among source countries, but also the second one is that as a result of pillar two, countries have a stronger incentive to reduce corporation tax and Hayden will follow on uh, with some more results on this from this work. Uh, thank you very much, John. Um, so yes, we'll hand over to Hayden to take this uh, one step further, thinking about tax credits and timing differences. Fantastic. Thank you. Just confirm that I can be heard. Wonderful. <clears throat> Um, so my presentation is really taking off from the, uh, a few points that Pascal has made about, um, well, what are the remaining channels for tax competition? And the starting point here is really can be put in this uh, point from the 8th of October statement that the global minimum tax agreement does not seek to eliminate tax competition, but puts multilateral, uh, multilaterally agreed limitations on it. And you will have heard Itai and Pascal both referring to that. So I'm really asking, well, well, what are those channels that have been allowed under the rules? What are we uh, letting go uh, and saying that's okay? Um, now, some things are obvious, like the SBIE, the substance-based income exclusion, means that you can compete uh, over the first amount of return uh, up to the formulaic carve-out. But there are some kind of a, a more unusual ones, and I plan to talk to two of those today. Uh, the first is tax credits, and the second is timing differences. So kind of jumping straight into it, how do the rules treat these tax credits? And I should note actually that um, you heard Itai refer to Pergubian subsidies being provided through the tax system. That's very much how can you use tax credits uh, to provide subsidies for, for kind of goods uh, in, in your society. Um, and the way the rules work is they divide tax credits into two categories, qualified refundable tax credits and just everything else really, non-qualified refundable tax credits. So. There is an exception to this, but as a general rule, you, the multinational would want to be in the qualified refundable tax credits, that gives you better treatment. And that's really where there's a tax credit that's refundable within four years in cash or cash equivalents. And the theory here is that that's really meant to be an equivalent to a grant that's being provided through the tax system. So uh, the, the government is providing cash, um, it's doing it through a refundable tax credit. As long as it's refundable, um, we'll treat that as it's equivalent to a grant and we, we won't have a problem with it. Um, and anything else that's non-refundable within four years is going to be uh, a non-QRTC. Non so what's the difference there? Well, starting on the right-hand side of the diagram, the non-QRTs are quite easy. They're just subtracted from covered taxes. So if you have a, uh, a starting tax liability of 15, but you have a refundable, sorry, non-refundable tax credit of 10, so you only end up paying five in tax, we're only going to treat your covered taxes as five. That's, that's pretty simple. It's as if you never paid the tax. Um, the QRTCs are the interesting ones, and that's, that's on the left-hand side of the diagram. Um, so instead of treating it as a reduction in your covered taxes, we're going to add it to your globe income. Uh, and that kicks into the rules in two places. The first is in determining your effective tax rate. So instead of your, your adjusted covered taxes on top of the globe income, you, you're adding the tax credit uh, to, to the denominator, uh, and you're not subtracting it from the numerator. And then it has a second kick on effects uh, again when you when you apply um, the top up tax in, in determining the amount of excess profit. So because QRTCs are added to the globe income, they increase your amount of excess profit. Now, I'll just run you through a quick example that makes that easier to follow. So here I'm imagining a, a company that's made a thousand of profit uh, and it's in a, in a system with a 15 percent corporate income tax rate but it also has $150 of 100, uh, qualified refundable tax credits. So from a domestic perspective, it has a tax liability of 150, but it has $150 of refundable tax credits. So it's not paying anything and it's not having anything refunded in the system. Now, at this point, I should pause and say, the rules don't let you simply just make your QRTC equal to 15% of the accounting profit, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. So for our example, a thousand of profit, $150 kind of prima facie tax liability, but with $150 tax credit, nothing's paid domestically. How do the globe rules treat that? 
Well, the numerator, you do not subtract the, the, the tax credit from the prima facie taxes. So you're treated as if paying 150 in taxes, even though you haven't paid anything. But your denominator is increased. So you've gone up from 1,000 to 1,150. And in this example, that gives us an, an ETR of 13.04%. And then the reverse of that is a top-up rate of 1.96%. Now, I've just put the SBIE here at zero. Nothing turns on that. It doesn't have to be. It just makes it kind of simpler to follow as an example. Um, so if we assume it's all excess profit in this case, um, there's no subtraction for SBIE. So we've got 1,150 uh, of excess profit. And then what's our top up tax? Well, our top up tax rate is only 1.96%. So it's 1.96% multiplied by the excess profit, 1,150, which gets you to $22.54. So the total amount of tax that's been paid in this jurisdiction is just $22.54. I'm assuming they've adopted a QDMTT just because it makes it easier. Um, but even if they didn't, it would just be $22.54 paid under the IIR or UTBR. Uh, it doesn't really make, make a difference. Um, so I've broken that down into, you've got $150 kind of prima facie tax liability, but you've then subtracted your $150 of tax credits, refundable tax credits. Um, and then you've just had to pay a top up of $22.54. So, you, so your real tax rate on $1,000 of profit is just 2.25%. Um, so you can get very low tax rates and much lower than 15% on excess profits, as long as the reason you're getting there uh, is through qualified refundable tax credits. So they're quite a powerful tool for, for tax competition as an allowable channel, um, but there are some limitations. But at the moment, those, those limitations really just focus on whether they're in fact refundable. They're not kind of substantive in the sense of limiting uh, the basis upon which you can provide them. So, so what does the commentary say on this? Well, the refund mechanism must have practical significance uh, for those taxpayers that will be entitled to the credit. Um, but whether that has practical significance, you don't look at the taxpayer, you look at the regime as a whole. So even if a regime doesn't produce any kind of in-scope entities that are in fact getting a refund, um, the, the regime may be appropriately set up from the perspective of the rules that, well, you could get one uh, in the right circumstances. And so therefore it's still gonna be treated as a, a qualified refundable tax credit. Um, but there aren't kind of explicit limitations on the purpose for which it's, it's, it's given. Now, there's a kind of a, a difficult line in here. The commentary talks about, you can't do something completely artificial, like uh, let's give everyone a 15% tax credit, uh, a tax credit equal to 15% of accounting profit because that will never produce an actual refund. It will just constantly produce the same outcome uh, whereby you're, you're basically not getting a refund. Uh, they wouldn't treat that as a qualified refundable tax credit. But then there's this really interesting line that says, if those jurisdictions that adopt the common approach identify risks associated with the treatment of tax credits and grants that lead to unintended out outcomes, the relevant jurisdictions could be asked to consider developing further conditions for a QRTC, or exploring alternative rules. Um, so they've really left themselves some space here, you know, in case something, this is, they're, they're getting outcomes that they think are, are unintentional. Um, maybe further rules that aren't currently uh, contained in the rules uh, could be developed. Um, but, but it's pretty non-committal here, talking about developing further conditions and exploring alternate rules. Uh, and it is probably worth noting, noting the wording here, the jurisdictions that adopt the common approach. I mean, this, this seems to be written, this, to me, this reads as saying, those that are applying the income inclusion rule, um, uh, not necessarily uh, those that have just you know, signed up as one of the 137, uh, but, but don't adopt the rules, don't make any changes to their own tax systems. So that's the first part, how, how tax credits can be used. Second part is timing differences. Some of you will be very across this and others less so. Um, this is my diagrammatic attempt at showing kind of how the rules deal with um, uh, timing differences. So I've got two colored circles here. Let's imagine the orange one is the domestic tax base and the blue one is the globe tax base. And you've got two different years. Now the rules recognize that the easiest example here is accelerated depreciation. Quite commonly, a domestic tax system will offer a greater deduction uh, in an earlier year than the globe uh, base will, which means that the domestic tax base will shrink and it will be smaller compared to the globe base. Uh, so how, how does that timing difference um, uh, get treated under the rules? Well, 
For this example, in year one, the domestic tax base is, is smaller, but it's going to be proportionately larger in year two. Uh, and so the problem is you're expecting to pay taxes, uh, more tax in a later year than you would need to under the globe rules, but you've paid less tax than the globe rules would expect you to pay this year. Uh, and, the, and the way that the rules address this is through deferred tax accounting, but, if, but at a high level, it's just, okay, we're gonna let you borrow taxes that you expect to pay in the future and count them towards this year um, for timing differences. So how does that work? Well, they adjust the numerator, not the denominator. You don't try and change the globe base. You add those additional uh, taxes through deferred tax accounting, relying on uh, the concept of deferred tax liabilities. Now, a really important part of this is that the rules require the deferred tax liability to be recast down to the minimum tax rate. So if you operate in a jurisdiction with a $30% a tax rate, you don't get to keep your DTLs at 30% when you're using them in this way. They get brought down to 15%. And the effect of that is just uh, the timing, the globe rules will not apply top-up tax to the timing difference itself but they won't let the timing difference generate kind of cover or a shelter uh, for other income. Now, this is one of the key points that BIAC uh, has written in a letter to the OECD about suggesting that they think it ought to be changed. Um, but there are three categories in, in terms of how, how these are treated, uh, these deferred tax liabilities. Um, the easiest one is just never allowed at all, always disallowed, uncertain tax positions. I won't speak any more about those. Uh, and then there are two categories left. One is the always allowed, and these are, as long as you can recognize the deferred tax liability for accounting purposes, you get to count the covered taxes uh, in the current year. There's no uh, clawback if the timing difference doesn't reverse within a period of time. Um, and then the second category is kind of everything else. Uh, and that's just, there's a five year recapture period. Um, so the, the, the always allowed category really looks like it's built around kind of long capital intensive uh, industries. So for example, if you have um, accelerated depreciation for a mine that's gonna have a 30 year life or longer, um, it would be very difficult if your timing difference is reversed within five years, uh, because the, the way the tax system is set up is that timing difference won't reverse for many, many more years than that. So this is kind of the, okay, we're comfortable with timing differences uh, indefinitely for, for those category of, uh, of things. Um, but everything else, we're going to have a five-year recapture rule, which is any timing difference you offer at all, uh, as long as it reverses within five years, we're going to treat you as having paid the covered tax now uh, and, not in, uh, and not make you recalculate. So what does that mean practically? Well, it allows a state to kind of shift from a low tax rate to trying to give kind of cash flow benefits to, to, to companies uh, through timing differences in their system. Um, so here I've kind of given you both examples. Um, if, say it's 2023, first year of the rules applying, if there's a timing difference, which is not expected to reverse until five years later, so year, well, year five here, um, which is sorry, four years later, um, as long as you're expecting to pay $100 of tax in year five, you get to count that towards year one. There's no attempt to deal with the time value of money um, there at all. And the same thing applies for the kind of always good categories. You know, you might be expecting to pay tax in 15 years time, out in 2037. They'll still let you can uh, treat $100 of taxes expected to be paid in year 15 as $100 of taxes paid now, um, again, subject to the recast. Um, that's quite a big uh, benefit. Now, in a very low interest rate world, you might not think that's a huge problem, uh, but if interest rates do rise, then you end up with a uh, greater and greater value from the perspective of an investor or from just FDI uh, in terms of not having to pay taxes for five years uh, and being able to treat yourself as not undertaxed for, for this year uh, in the meantime. So where does that leave us? Well, okay, there are some remaining channels for tax competition. Uh, the rules have explicitly allowed these channels to, to, to continue applying. One is on the use of QRTCs, and they can allow for very low real rates of tax, well below 15% of excess profits. But you're subject to this kind of concern with respect to, is it, is it in genuinely refundable? And also that interesting language about maybe we'll need something further here. Uh, and the second one being timing, difference, uh, timing differences, states can shift uh, give benefits on the time value of money without incurring top-up tax liabilities under Pillar 2. And I should say under Pillar 2, under either the QDMTT or the income inclusion rule. It, 
they can still use the QDMTT and, and compete on these bases. So the, the question I'm really asking is then, well, are we likely to see a shift from rate competition to base competition through allowed channels under the rules? Um, and there seem to be open avenues for doing so. Now, just to be clear, which is not to say that we haven't put a, a base at all on, on tax competition. I think Pascal was kind of right to assert that there are these multilateral, multilaterally agreed limits to it. Um, but these available channels uh, do seem to be quite significant. Uh, and it'll be very interesting to see uh, whether or not states uh, that are currently offering tax incentives, uh, whether that's in their interest or not, um, will be pushed or will choose to continue trying to use these channels to, to offer them, uh, or whether they'll just converge around the base without taking, without using uh, these channels for tax competition. So on that note, I'm, I might have back to Mike. Thank you, Hayden. Uh, that's great. We're going to have uh, move straight on with a somewhat change of emphasis and look at some broader economic questions now. And Iram is going to introduce those for us. Hayden, can you just um, stop sharing and uh, Iram? Um... Can you see my screen? Yes, thanks. Great. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to address hundreds of you, hundreds of participants from different parts of the tax world and uh, to be part of such a fantastic lineup. I'll draw on some papers um, that I've been working on jointly with Mike and other former colleagues, Francois and Kat. And I'll ask three main questions um, in, in my 10 minutes. So one is about tax competition. And the main question that we've been asking since the start of the panel of you know, how pillar two changes the incentive to shift profits. The second question is about efficiency. And I'll give a bit more of a detailed description of what we mean by this. So the question is whether pillar two reduces the distortion to investment location by reducing the dispersion in effective tax rates. A lot of the proponents um, argue that by pr uh, putting this floor on, um, on international tax rates, we're going to um, reduce the distortion internationally of these tax rates and also limit the distortion to investment location driven um, by tax competition. And finally, the question about investment. Now I get to the opponents and say, well, pillar two might you know, curb investment and you know, we're gonna lose jobs, um, big investment, big capital. So we ask the question about whether pillar two depresses investment and other real activity by multinationals and would it would do so, if, if it does, it would do so by raising the required rate of return on investments. The background work uh, towards this draws on two projects and working papers on these will um, soon be available. One is uh, going back to Mike's uh, original work in 1998 with Rachel Griffith on effective average tax rates to describe how uh, multinational chooses, choose their investment location. What we do here is that we incorporate profit shifting and the minimum tax threshold rates to the effective average um, tax rate framework, which I'll um, call EATR framework, which already incorporates the financial return depreciation and investment incentives, um, such as patent boxes, R&D tax breaks, or um, you know, accelerated depreciation accounted for in um, location choice. Now, we also have a more complicated model to talk about in a separate paper, we have a more complicated paper to talk about how multinationals invest in productive capital alongside um, you know, investments in a network of tax haven, low tax and high tax country subsidiaries to lower global tax liability. We call that a structural model and we have an estimation strategy in relation to that. What that model allows us to do is to talk about how investment incentives and also profit shifting incentives out of higher tax jurisdictions um, change with the introduction of different with the introduction of any tax rate changes. So it gives us a framework to actually simulate uh, lots of different um, tax changes in the international tax system. What that allows us to say is um, something about, you know, the differences or the heterogeneities across different types of firms, those that, you know, shift a bit of profit um, to tax havens, and also those that shift, 
you know, almost all of their profit to tax um, tax havens. And it really allows us to look at that higher end of the distribution and say something about um, the changes in multinationals with any positive profit in high tax jurisdictions. We call that extensive mar uh, margin responses to, um, you know, in, in, in terms of profit shifting. Let me step back and talk about what I mean by the EATR framework, because, you know, not everyone is academics, you don't have to remember the Devereux Griffith uh, 98 framework. What it does is to say, um, let's think about a multinational and it's choosing between an investment project in a high tax or in a low tax country. So the multinational chooses the location which will yield the highest post-tax profit. Post-tax pro profit, of course, depends on economic conditions, which kind of gives us uh, the pre-tax profit in each potential host country and the proportion of profit that is levied in tax, typically measured by an effective average tax rate. So we combine the economic conditions with the tax um, environment, including any incentives and the rates. So the base and the rate um, related measures are both included. We then take a whole bunch of OECD countries that we um, observe in our Center for Business Taxation um, tax database, and we simulate the effect of the global minimum tax at different threshold rates. So if we look at the you know, zero rate here on this horizontal axis, that's basically a world, the, the world that we live in. There's no um, global minimum tax. And then as we move along this axis, what we have is a higher and higher global minimum tax threshold rate. Of course, the current discussion, under the current discussion, we're at exactly at the middle of this graph at the 15% minimum rate. What are these lines doing? The line, the blue line, is showing us the proportion of profit shifted from an average representative OECD country out to a tax haven, right? So, so it's the profit shifting share, share of profits shifted. So as we have a higher and higher minimum tax threshold, and let me take us all the way to 15%, we see a halving almost of um, profits shifted out of the average um, OECD country. And um, you know, so, so that leads us to say, well, actually um, the global minimum tax is probably a useful tool to um, reduce profit shifting, given that's one of the aims. At the same time, what it does is that it really increases the effective average tax rate uh, for an investment that takes place in this uh, um, average OECD country. So gradually we see a rise in the effective average tax rates. And mind you, this is a bit different from the um, effective tax rates because it's forward looking, it thinks about the incentives as well. Um, and then as we hit perhaps a 20% minimum rate, the kind of increase in this effective tax rate um, goes up rapidly. How about the dispersion of tax rates across different countries. And, and a good measure of dispersion is the standard deviation. And we have different lines here. I'll draw your attention initially to just the red line here, and then I'll explain what the different lines do. But as the global minimum rate threshold increases, gradually the dispersion across tax rates also increase. Hey, this is counterintuitive. Like what the argument here is, is that we expect a harmonization of tax rates and therefore we should expect this dispersion to reduce. But what happens is that at the low rates of the global minimum tax threshold, we observe that the impact on high tax countries' tax rates, effective, effective average tax rates in high tax countries rise more than they do in um, low tax jurisdictions, and therefore the dispersion initially increases. After about you know, 10, 12% uh, percent, uh, minimum rate threshold, and at the 15%, let me get here, we're about the same place where we've started. So in terms of efficiency gains, we kind of go back to square number one, 
Um, so we've started, we've raised the dispersion, but now we've dropped it. Looking at this graph, actually a higher and higher rate is going to give us higher and higher efficiency gains. So one might um, say, oh, why don't we then set a very high global minimum tax um, threshold rate? But of course, that's going to have implications in terms of investment. Now, what are the different lines that we see here? These are different assumptions related to how multinationals respond to differentials between uh, tax rates between two jurisdictions. So it's, it can be thought of as the response um, in terms of profit shifting to a change in the differential between um, the you know, high tax country tax rate or, or the home tax country, um, home country tax rate and either the minimum rate or the tax haven rate if there is no minimum rate. So they, there, these are different assumptions on firms' responses, but changes in those assumptions doesn't change the main takeaway message from this graph. What is our takeaway? Impact on the dispersion of tax rates varies based on the pillar two threshold. So for low values of the um, pillar two threshold, actually the introduction of the minimum tax increases EATRs more in high tax countries relative to low tax countries, increasing the dispersion. For high values of the threshold, more low tax countries um, set their tax rate at the threshold. And this move by uh, lower tax countries actually reduces uh, the dispersion. Now we get to, uh, then why don't we set a very high rate, high threshold rate? Well, that's gonna increase the cost of capital and the cost of capital has a direct implication on, on investment. If we again look at the um, OECD average at a 0% minimum rate, so in the absence of the global minimum tax, um, you can go, this is a publicly available data set. You can um, go and calculate actually based on pre-pandemic um, tax environments of OECD countries and average cost of capital of 6.25. If we had a minimum rate threshold of 15%, that takes us up to 6.59, which is an increase of 5.4% um, percent in cost of capital. Now, if you know, like we, we can simulate various different scenarios, if that minimum rate threshold increases, to 25%, then the average cost of capital rises to 6.85. That means oh, uh, close to a 10% increase in cost of capital. Well, what does that mean for the change in investment? That takes us to earlier um, works on you know, um, the, the, the response of investment to tax rate um, changes or the tax environment changes. So. What's been found in the literature is that, well, the capital stock respond, will respond almost one for one to uh, percentage changes in cost of capital. So if we see a 5.4% increase in the cost of capital, we can expect up to a 5% or 5.4% decrease in the accumulated capital stock. Um, so the literature's finding is somewhere between, you know, minus a half and minus one. So which takes us to a uh, scenario of uh, contraction in uh, capital stock on average at the OECD of between 2.5% um, to 5.4%. Um, so, so this is, I mean, one can then do this for different countries and say that investment hubs like Ireland would be affected more um, relative to others. And you know, one can incorporate other features of the global minimum tax as well. So there is a cost of increasing the threshold um, and a benefit of you know, like reducing perhaps distortions. Let me conclude by revisiting the three main questions that our research address. One is about profit shifting. So how does Pillar 2 change the incentive to shift profit? Well, we find that Pillar 2 substantially reduces incentives to shift profit to tax havens with pronounced extensive margin responses. What that means is that it actually really affects um, those firms that 
shift almost all of their profit to um, tax havens. But then our more complicated model also says that these firms have already invested in an infrastructure to shift profits. So they might keep doing it given that they already have the, um, the framework available. And then in thinking about the efficiency gain, well, just pillar two, reduce the distortion to investment location by reducing the dispersion and effective tax rates. At the 15% threshold, uh, we don't find a substantial reduction in the distortion to businesses location decisions. At a higher threshold rate, we, we do see such an effect. Finally, on investment, uh, we asked a question about whether Pillar 2 depresses investment and other real activity by m &Es by raising the required rate of return. Um, we do see some effect um, on investment at the 15% threshold. The reaction can be said to be not very large. At higher threshold rates, the adverse effect on investments is substantial in investment hubs. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm very happy to follow up um, offline and the papers will soon be available. Thank you very much, Irem. That covered actually a, a vast amount of ground in a very short space of time, so thank you. And uh, last but certainly not least, Martin Zimler is going to talk about some uh, work using accounting data. Thank you much, Mike. So I'm going to talk a bit uh, about some empirical observations related to Pillar 1, uh, Pillar 2, apologies. <laughs> so we have been doing quite some work over the last months and uh, hopefully there will be a comprehensive policy brief at some point. Um, I'm focusing here on two dimensions that we believe are particularly relevant. So the first uh, question I would like to talk about is the incentive to introduce Pillar 2. So are we really going to end up with almost all countries having introduced Pillar 2? And my, <clears throat> I thought that I have to start with a kind of quote from Pascal saint uh that summarizes more or less, I believe, the thinking of the OECD and everybody who was involved. But I can now rely on uh, more or less the statements that I got from Itai and also Pascal in the first part of this this webinar and both highlighted that we do need a critical mass of countries that are willing to implement pillar two and i would like to build up on this so what i first would like to highlight is that <clears throat> these critical mass is not uh, or are not the countries that have signed up to pillar two because pillar two has the form of a common approach which means no country has signed up to introduce really pillar two but only to accept if pillar two is applied by other countries uh, the next point is that <clears throat> if we look on kind of the incentive to in introduce the income inclusion rule, we have to note that this depends heavily on the credibility of the under tax payment rule as a backstop. So what we need to have is kind of a force that really pushes country to introduce the income inclusion rule. And <clears throat> now we have to think about what's the incentive to introduce the under tax payment rule. And if we start from a single country perspective, we must say, <clears throat> It might introduce the UTPR, hoping to gain a lot of tax revenue, but it could also mean that the MNE then responds to the country introducing the UTPR by giving up all the subsidiaries it has in this particular country. And so this could mean the <clears throat> country tries to get revenue, but it loses only in the end real activity. And so what we really need that pillar two will be applied widely is a few countries so this is really the critical mass that is willing to introduce pillar two, even if it means it comes at a loss of some real activity. And, and this is really kind of the important part that the majority of the in-scope MEs have links to the few countries that will implement pillar two. So the idea here is that if we have a few countries that are willing to implement it, and most of the in-scope MEs have subsidiaries in these countries, then the m &E cannot just, or the m &Es cannot just respond by giving up the subsidiaries because then the costs are too high for them. So what we did in this kind of exercise was to say, okay, let's try to understand what's the structure of m &Es, of the in-scope m &Es. What is the link between different G7 countries? So we are focusing here on the G7. We're using data for consolidated accounts for the in-scope m &Es, and we know their ownership structure. So we know where the subsidiaries are located and also where the headquarter is located. What we don't know is how important the particular subsidiary is. So we don't have a proxy for subsidiary profits or real activity. 
Another limitation is that we don't observe all in scope MEs because for some in scope firm groups, the ownership structure is not observed. Two important assumptions are underlining our results. And these are that we assume that the UTPR allows countries to collect all top up tax. And theoretically, this is kind of easily possible, but in practice, it might not be the case. In particular, some countries are most likely facing constitutional limitations on how much firms can be taxed. So is it really possible to allocate all under tax profits to a subsidiary in a particular jurisdiction that applies the pillar to? And the second assumption we have to make is that there's a sufficiently strong link between under tax and total profits. We don't observe under tax profits and so we're relying on total profits. But of course, if we wanna say anything about under tax profits, we have to make this assumption. These are our main results. <clears throat> and the table might look quite complicated, but I explain it step by step. So we start from the MEs that are headquartered in particular, she's seven country. So we have US, Canada, and so on, and Italy. The first or the second row then shows you just what is the total pre tax profit of MEs headquartered in a particular G7 country. And the third row gives us kind of the first part we cite, you could say because it says how much of the profits or what's the share of profits belonging to MEs headquartered in this particular G7 country that has, has no subsidy, subsidiary in another G7 country. So for the US, for example, we observe that 4% of the profits of US MEs belong to MEs that don't have a subsidiary in any other G7 country except for the US. And if you go down the line, you see that in most cases, MEs headquartered in G7 countries are active in at least two G7 countries. But this might not be enough because what we need is we really need many or at least a few countries that can access these profits of MEs headquartered in another country to create this credible threat. And so let me focus now on the, on the US Germany link here to explain the table. So this is the 73%. And what it means is that if Germany introduces the UTPR, it can access 73% of the profits of US MEs. And if we look into all other bilateral pairs, we you see that in most cases, this fraction is relatively high. So about above two thirds. And so this means if we would have, for example, Germany and France and the UK as this critical mass who are really willing to implement pillar two. This would mean the US would be almost forced to apply the IIR because they would gain the additional tax revenue, but would not really change the tax liability for the companies. And the companies can also not just give up their links in Germany, France, and UK because they would just lose a substantial part of their activity. And so the table hopefully makes sure that it's indeed only a few countries are needed to force all other countries in the G7 to implement pillar two. So it could be, for example, if Germany, France, UK would be willing, this seems to be enough to get at least pillar two for all G7 countries. If all G7 countries would introduce pillar two, what we find is that about 86% of the in-scope MEs would be subject to pillar two and about 93% of the in-scope ME profits would be subject to pillar two. And just as a kind of a side remark here, there are of course some MEs who would not be covered or not be subject to pillar two. And of course, these are mainly located in Asia because the G7 has this slight West focus. And so what we can say is about 20% of the profits of MEs headquartered in Asia would not be subject to pillar two. And if we would like to get them included as well to really gain the largest coverage, what we would need to have as jurisdictions as Hong Kong or China also joining the critical mass. Since so far, it seems to be in particular the EU countries who are going to introduce pillar two. Let me just add the results for them here as well. So if only the EU countries would introduce pillar two, about 70% of the in-scope MEs would be subject to pillar two and around 85% of the in-scope ME profits would be subject. The second part I would like to talk here about is the relative size of the substance-based income exclusion. So the question we are asking, what is the share of profits shielded from pillar two? 
due to the SBIE. And we are using unconsolidated financial statements of foreign owned firms in Europe to answer this question. So we do need some information to calculate the uh, SBIE. So we don't have really all firms included in the analysis, but only subsamples. And we also have to exclude some firms. So we exclude firms with non -profit positive profits, because for them the tax consequences are not that obvious. We also exclude firms with negative equity because they usually struggle for uh, other reasons. What we also exclude are firms with relatively high pre-tax profits over sales, uh, because we are concerned that here this is not taxable income that is driving the profits, but non-taxable income like dividends. And the last uh, caveat is that we have to exclude firms in the Netherlands, Latvia and Lithuania, because we don't observe that many firms in these jurisdictions. So let me share the first perspective of our results, which is the firm level perspective. So here we are relating on the firm level, the value of the substance-based income exclusion to pre-tax profits. So if the ratio is one, <coughs> we know that all profits are shielded from pillar two. If we would be uh, left of the red line, then this means not all profits are, are shielded. And on the right hand side of the red line, we know that there's excess SBIE. And this is quite a substantial amount as well. So the main results are that around 30% of the firms face no top up tax due to the SBIE in the first year. And as Pascal like, explained in the beginning, <coughs> of course, the generosity of the substance based income exclusion decreases over time. We start with 10% of payroll and 8% of tangible assets. And then it goes down to 5% after 10 years. So then we estimate that only about 20% of the firms would face no top up tax due to the SBIE. If we look on the average, we can say the SBIE shields about 56% of profits of the average firm in the first year and around 40% after 10 years. And for all the economists in the room who would like to know what's the ratio of SBIE to normal return. We can say if the normal return would be around 10% of equity, which seems a reasonable assumption, then the SBIE shields about 76% on average in the first year, which goes then down to 60%. So the second perspective I would like to share with you is the country level perspective. And what is important here is that when we aggregate the value of the substance-based income exclusion to profits, we ignore that some firms have unused or excess SBIE. So we limit the ratio of substance-based income exclusion to profits to one. Um, this graph shows you the share of total profit shielded um, in relationship to the tax rate or the headline tax rate in these different EU European countries. And the first thing you can observe is that the share of total profit shielded depends relatively little on the statutory corporate tax rate or the effective average tax rate. And we did this analysis just to kind of come up with a bit of um, <coughs> confidence that our results are not too much driven by focusing only on the European countries. Main finding is that the share of total profit shielded is on average 33% in the first year. And this goes down to about 20% after 10 years. And as you probably already have spotted, there are kind of two types of countries. Uh, normal ones, you could say, which are really all have a share of total profit shielded around 40%, going down to maybe 35% for the high tax countries. And some other countries, namely Ireland, Belgium, Malta, and Luxembourg, which have a substantially lower share of total profit shielded between 5 and 25%. That's from my side. Thank you so much. And back to Mike. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, we are actually about out of time for the presentations. There have been uh, a few questions put into the q and I suggest we hold them, see if they have time for them later, or uh, anybody who has specific questions is welcome to contact you know, any of the individual researchers directly. But I don't want to uh, take too much time now in having questions and holding up the next panel. So uh, thanks again to those, uh, to everybody who's presented there. Um, I hope people find that useful. We are now going to move on to the panel and uh, I'm going to invite John to chair it. Uh, thanks, Mike. And um, I'm sorry, I lost connection right at the vital moment there. But thank you, Mike, and thank you, um, 
to my um, the other people who are on the the pre on the previous session. So the session was, as you could see, based on academic research we've been undertaking at the Center for Business Taxation. But now we're going to move to a discussion. Uh, we have a very dis distinguished group of panelists who, from uh, practice and policy, but also many of them have uh, actually an involvement in tax teaching and tax research too. So I'll introduce the speakers very briefly and then we'll, each speaker will start with a brief introductory statement and then we're going to have a, a conversation and a discussion among the, about the very, Num uh, the very interesting issues that arose throughout the uh, uh, conference thus far. So our first speaker is Georgia Maffini. So Georgia is currently a special advisor on tax policy and transfer pricing at PwC. But before that, uh, Georgia was deputy head of tax policy and statistics at the tax policy and statistics division at the, at the OECD Center for Tax Policy and Administration. And before the OECD, Georgia was a, a dearly loved colleague at the CBT. The speaker after that is Dave Murray. Uh, Dave is a head of tax policy and sustainability at Anglo-American, and but he's also the chair of the CIOT International Tax Committee. The third speaker is Vicky Perry. Uh, Vicky is the former deputy director of the Fiscal Affairs Division at the IMF, and currently she's a visiting professor at Oxford, so we are very happy to have Vicky with us uh, for a year. The speaker after that will be Paul Oosterhaus, who had a very distinguished career at uh, Skadden Arps, where he is currently off council, but Paul also uh, teaches at Columbia University and also uh, is quite a prolific uh, writer. And uh, finally, uh, Dan Needle, who currently, for the next four weeks, will be a senior tax partner at Clifford Chance. But after that, uh, Dan is retiring to set up a pro bono tax policy boutique. So fantastic uh, lineup of speakers. We'll start with a brief introductory statement and then we'll move on to a discussion. So uh, first, Georgia. Thank you, John, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I think I'll be using my introductory statement to just focus our attention now, the implementation, the practical implementation of Pillar 2 sometimes takes us away from some principles that have been underpinning tax policy choices and tax policy uh, and tax design for uh, a few decades. So it's not my intervention is not about the idea of a per country minimum tax system, but it's about the practical implementation. I will use two examples. The first one is an example about uh, double taxation. And the second is an example about um, uh, loss making companies uh, having to pay tax. So with respect to uh, the first example, it seems that under the pillar two rules, refunds of top up taxes paid in the past will not be possible. So let's see what this means uh, uh, for the overall system. If we look, for example, at the rules for transfer pricing adjustment under Pillar 2, they seem to provide that a multinational will have to adjust its globe income uh, accordingly to whatever adjustment has been made in the tax return whenever there is a unilateral transfer pricing adjustment that increases or decreases the tax base in a high tax jurisdiction, okay? And then a corresponding adjustment to the globe income needs to be made in the counterparty as well, in the other jurisdiction. So now assume that the adjustment affects past income. This is a very realistic assumption because you could be looking at an audit on past years. Also assume, again, very realistically, that the adjustment in the higher tax jurisdiction increases taxable income. And uh, also assume that the counterparty is instead in a low tax jurisdiction. Now, in that low tax jurisdiction, the income has already been taxed under Pillar 2. So there we already have a, had uh, a top-up tax to 15%. But we said at the beginning that it seems that under Pillar 2, no refund of that top-up tax is possible. 
Okay, so what does this mean? This implies that the upward adjustment uh, will be taxed in the high tax jurisdiction, say at 25% in the UK in 2023, but the same income will have already been taxed in the low tax jurisdiction in the past at 15%. Um, it won't be possible to get uh, the top up uh, back from the low tax jurisdiction. So you can look at this in different ways. You can see the double taxation, but also as uh, from the perspective of an economist, you really see a hidden increase in the cost of capital. And Irem has uh, described very well what that means for investment for the economy. So the truth, the true tax rate uh, really goes beyond the minimum 15% and also beyond the local rate in the high tax jurisdiction because we are first taxing at 15 and then when there is an adjustment we are taxing at say uh, 25. There are other implications for uh, the lack of uh, refunds uh, of top up taxes paid in the past. These implications have to do with the incentives to tax authorities. We don't have time to, think, uh, to talk about that, but just quickly pointing out that without refunds of, of top up taxes paid in the past, no tax authorities in the system, in the Pillar 2 system, loses out from uh, aggressive tax audits. So after Pillar 2, we are probably likely to see uh, more frequent, more aggressive tax audits because the high tax jurisdiction will increase its tax base, its revenues, but no one else will lose out because there is no refund. The second point is a bit more well known, at least in the business community. So it's generally understood under corporate income tax that um, loss making entities should not be paying corporate income tax. But under Pillar 2, if a multinational has an accounting loss, and in addition to that loss, it also has a favorable permanent book tax difference, then in that case, there will be a top up, irrespective of whether the company sits in a low or high tax jurisdiction. This top up, we have to say, is not, of course, on the accounting loss, but it's on the permanent difference. But the result is always the same. So there will be cases in which a business that is running a loss will have to pay a top up. So we'll have to pay tax. And this is something very unusual in the tax system. And there are reasons why the tax system uh, generally doesn't want to see uh, companies paying taxes. There wouldn't be a base, by the way. So overall, Pillar 2, I think, is much more revolutionary than we thought at the beginning. So we knew that the idea of a per country minimum tax system was revolutionary. But I think that until we saw the modern rules, we didn't grasp how revolutionary also the application of, of uh, Pillar 2 is in reality. And probably it's worth rethinking some of these points. So the double taxation, the taxation of companies that are running a loss, because this, in a way, these are technical points, are points, again, about the implementation. They are not points about the global agreement that has been reached in the summer. And I honestly, John, remain optimistic because if the implementation timeline is delayed in key jurisdiction, that will give more time to work out these technical design features. And in a way, it's physiological that such an important big agreement completed so quickly will need to be adjusted uh, uh, a little bit. And also I have to say that um, uh, in the UK, we have seen Treasury and HMRC reaching out to stakeholders with very useful um, stakeholders meetings that in the last two months, I think have improved our understanding of um, this new system and its challenges and what we can do about that. Um, and John, I think I'll stop here and see if uh, later on there are any questions. Thank you uh, very much, Georgia. Um, David? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, Georgia was also a beloved colleague of mine in a, in a former life. Uh, it's always hard to, to follow her, but I will, I will do my best. Um, so, I mean, this project's come a long way since it started. It's even come a long way since the blueprint, uh, actually. And there have been a number of businesses, um, our own included, who've been very engaged throughout. Um, and there have throughout been a, 
a range of quite different views on the policy objectives of Pillar 2, both in, in isolation and in combination with, with Pillar 1. Uh, my, my business has been quite supportive of both pillars. I think levelling the playing field, modernising the way the tax system attributes taxing rights in a way that's acceptable to countries in which we operate, you know, that, that, that's positive developments uh, relative to the alternative. Uh, as an extractive business, we already pay significant tax in the countries where we generate value. And so we see that as a sort of key part of our relationship with society uh, anyway. But sort of regardless of the mixed views of business on that overarching policy objective, uh, and the range of points at which businesses have got involved over the last few years. Um, you know, the model rules and the commentary and the UK consultation uh, and the EU uh, implementation frameline, they've really made this real, I think, for, for all large taxpayers. And I think we're seeing uh, a lot more businesses get involved now in thinking about this. Uh, we're seeing some emerging trends in terms of how businesses are viewing the mechanisms through which those policy objectives are, are implemented as I say, regardless of whether they like the policy objectives or, or not. Uh, I think in general, businesses welcome the model rules and the commentary, not, notwithstanding the timing of the release being the day, you know, the day before Christmas Eve, uh, and the fact that we've only had the commentary for a few weeks now, you know, recognizing there was already a political agreement in place, these rules were coming. So actually being able to see the detail for the first time, it's a really good start. And, and for many businesses who haven't been involved throughout, and even for many businesses who, who have been quite involved throughout, um, you know, this is really the first time we're getting to see the real detail uh, of these rules. Um, and it's a rather different place, I think, to, to, to where some people would have expected this to, to end up. So I think we're also very welcoming of the consultation that the OECD are running on the implementation framework. I think that consultation is going to be key. The, the really big challenge that businesses have to navigate in the coming months and year, uh, and maybe years, is that gap between the model rules and the commentary on the one hand, and how we're actually going to comply with the regime in practice on the other. And to be frank, that gap right now feels like it's quite a big one. So there's sort of, there's around 40 areas in the commentary, I think, which, which the commentary itself refers to more work yet to be done in the implementation framework. So there's still a lot of areas in there, but we haven't quite got the certainty we need on how the rules are going to operate. And a lot of the tension around that depends on when these model rules are actually converted into law in individual countries. So once a country publishes draft law, large businesses will start need to start considering the impact for their statutory accounting. They're going to need to discuss that with their auditors. When, when the law hits substantive enactment, they're going to actually need to start providing for, for the tax and potentially amending their deferred tax balances that they hold on, the, on their balance sheet. So if, if we see substantive enactment pretty quickly, maybe you know, uh, late this year or early next year in the UK, some companies are going to have year ends near that time or interim accounts very soon after. And that's not much time for them to assess the impact, um, particularly when uh, there are so many uh, elements that are, that are being held over for the implementation framework. You know, it's not up to businesses to convince the auditors that the rules will not, or I suppose in some cases that the rules will have a material impact on their financial accounts. You know, it, it's, it's that you have to demonstrate to your auditors that you've done the work uh, around that. And so it's really hard to say with any degree of certainty when there are so many technical uncertainties remaining, you know, what the actual impact will be. You know, these rules are really complex. They produce some outcomes that you might not expect if you're only looking at the high level political uh, commitments. So, the, you know, the, the lack of full recognition for deferred tax or the way that joint ventures or partially owned parent entities are going to be taken into account. You know, I'm not here to argue with the policy decisions on those. But it, I think it is important to know that it's not just as simple as looking at your accounting ETR, but corporates are going to be put in, in positions where they have to have really assessed the impact of this far beyond the date, they, you know, far in advance of the date that they just have to comply with the rules and, and pay an additional tax. So I've certainly been going for five minutes. So you know, I will close by saying that, like Georgia, I'm optimistic that all these challenges and uncertainties can be addressed in the implementation framework and probably through lots of hard work from corporates as well, building the systems in advance of some of those uncertainties being resolved. But the accelerated and concurrent timelines to pass the law while still dealing with the open questions in the implementation framework is, uh, is certainly going to give businesses real challenges in the meantime. And I would encourage you know, all businesses to really start thinking about this as soon as they can. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, Vicky? Thank you, John. And uh, thanks to everybody for having me. Um, so my role is just to speak briefly 
um, to put a little more emphasis on low income countries. And by that, I'm referring to um, actual sort of source company countries, the recipients of foreign direct investment, not to what we might call think of as uh, tax planning hubs, um, low tax countries, but low income countries. Um, the provisions of Pillar 2 should certainly have significant effect on how uh, low income developing countries um, it will certainly have a big impact on them. And I would certainly agree with Pascal and other speakers who've made this point um, that this will be a positive impact. Um, the Pillar 2 top-up tax regime will provide indirectly a floor on tax competition. That's all been referred to um, since somewhere the multinational group will be paying an effective tax rate of 15% uh, on excess profit. Um, whatever they may be paying in the low income country. And that point's been made all along, all during the process of developing uh, the minimum tax. Um, but since, we, since December, it's clear that greater direct benefits can now be obtained relative to what we were expecting as late as last October because of the introduction of the QDMTT, the Qualified Domestic Minimum Tax con Concept and its positioning as first in the hierarchy of assigning the top-up tax, if any. And I would echo what I think was clear from what others have said, some others, that there would seem to be no reason for low-income countries that are or that even hope to be importers of capital investment not to adopt the qualifying domestic minimum tax um, and therefore to receive directly any increase in effective globe-covered taxes um, that are paid with respect to a covered activity in their own jurisdiction. Um, how many sub-Saharan African countries, for example, would be home to investment by in-scope m &E groups? Certainly, and thinking of that we just heard from Dave, uh, certainly most or all of the major natural resource exporters will be. And at the least, many other countries will have multinational affiliated companies that are uh, providing telecommunications um, in their country. So what should they do? Um, or what should we think about uh, Pillar 2? Again, against the background that I would say this is a very good thing. Um, a quibble with the SBIE. Um, certainly many who have spent their life working on increasing domestic revenue mobilization in low-income countries, uh, many of my former colleagues, would prefer that the SBIE had not been included. That is that the minimum effective rate apply to the full return to the m &E activity and not just the supra normal or excess profit return above real activity. But it does have to be recognized that in fact, many low income countries did not feel that they could stop competing through tax for, for investment. Um, the vast majority of, for example, Sub-Saharan African countries um, do offer some kinds of tax incentives for investment, the vast majority, if not all. And frequently they offer that in the least uh, effective form, which is tax holidays. That practice has increased hugely over the past 25 years. Tax competition, to state the obvious, is not just about headline tax rates. It's grown exponentially through incentive competition. And this, uh, despite quite a lot of analysis showing that tax incentive grants aren't particularly effective or at best constitute a kind of losing prisoner's dilemma situation for the countries in the region, low-income countries. And despite an ever-increasing need, even worse now that we've had the COVID crisis for raising domestic revenue. But here we are. Um, and as you've heard, the SBIE does have some effect on how these countries can compete with each other. I'd just like to focus though for a moment on non-qualified domestic minimum tax, minimum taxes. Roughly a third of Sub-Saharan African countries now have a domestic minimum tax based on turnover. And I differentiate that from sort of small minimum taxes from turn on turnover that are used as presumptive taxes for little businesses. These are essentially add-on minimum taxes of the kind that some um, practitioners in advanced countries will be familiar with. Um, they typically create an add-on minimum tax above otherwise applicable regular corporate income taxes. So like pillar two, but domestically, they set a kind of floor under overall tax payments by any particular company. 
it's worth noting that those type of turnover minimum taxes are not, it appears, covered taxes for purposes of Pillar 2, but they would reduce the financial accounting profit base, and thus um, they would generally wind up reducing any top-up tax, but by nowhere near at a one-for-one -one ratio. So this is less key if the country is also adopting a QT, QDMTT um, to collect the top-up tax itself. But I would just emphasize for countries, it's very important to note that these domestic unilateral minimum taxes will continue to increase their overall tax take under the low, uh, in the country, including from profits that aren't in scope for pillar two. And therefore, from a revenue standpoint, domestic minimum taxes should be continued or encouraged, even in the form of uh, AMT turnover taxes. Pillar 2 shouldn't disincentivize their use since they already exist and they existed before Pillar 2 was even thought of. Um, just a quick note on, the, I'm conscious of the time, but a quick note on the subject to tax rule, which I believe Pascal alluded to. Um, this is the one that will permit low income countries to demand that their higher income treaty partners under existing treaties adjust the bilateral withholding rates. Um, where effective taxation on the receiving end of the payment is less than 9%. Um, this is considerably below the pillar two minimum effective rate, although perhaps that shouldn't be particularly surprising since the 9% applies to gross payments, not profits. So as far as it goes, this provision uh, should be a good thing for many developing countries, some of which uh, might have or uh, develop buyer's remorse with some of the provisions that have been signed in bilateral tax treaties. Um, and in many cases, the, these bilateral reductions have been a, a primary instrument for profit shifting. Um, and in fact, demands for including such bilateral treaty provisions with low withholding have been a means of tax competition in many cases. Um, and they're certainly a factor in reducing domestic taxes. Um, but the rule applies to interest and royalty payments, and as important as these are, the rule as it's now envisioned, though it's not been elaborated, would not cover other important ways of stripping income out of low-income countries, um, especially technical and management service fees, which are uh, of late of great importance in the UN. Some of you may know the UN has been focused on these types of payments in its uh, model treaty recently. But again, bottom line, it would be undoubtedly, to the extent that this applies, it's, it's a good idea to take advantage of it. Uh, and finally, referring to, uh, Georgia talked about uh, transfer pricing adjustments um, and their possible impact on timing and, and, uh, and non-refundability. But I think that just goes to underscore the fact that none of this, none of Pillar 2 um, will have any effect on transfer mispricing. The arm's length method is still there and it will result in possibly uh, for low income countries, the same kind of transfer mispricing in uh, financial accounting profits um, that's already there, which would argue, I think, uh, for accompanying uh, safe harbors for low-income countries. And we see that already, not in pillar one, but in pillar, and not in pillar two, but in pillar one in the proposals for amount B. Um, so bottom line, pillar two, I think is a good thing for low-income developing countries. It's not perfect from their point of view, but it is certainly, especially with the introduction of the QDMTT, going to be, I, I would say, quite beneficial. So I'm gonna stop there, John, and turn back to you. Thanks, and we can move forward uh, immediately to Paul. Sure, and let, let me pick up on uh, what some of the earlier speakers here have said uh, from a US perspective, uh, taking off my practitioner hat and, and putting on the hat of somebody who's been around US tax developments for a long time. I think the US has a couple of lessons that can be relevant to uh, pillar two. The, the first is let's not let, let, let's not uh, work, let's not let perfection be the enemy of the good here. We in the United States we've had um, long experience with taxing 
uh, international income, obviously our guilty provisions was the first try at a, at a, at a global minimum tax in some fashion. But really going back to subpart F in 1962, we have had a long reach of taxing multinationals. And one of the things we learned from that is you never get it completely right the first time you enact the legislation. It takes time. We've actually, I think, with, with uh, pillar two, with the model rules and the commentary, we've advanced the ball a lot more than the US ever did when its legislation went effective. Uh, in those kinds of provisions. Our guilty provisions didn't have anything like the kind of detail we now have with Pillar 2 to give us some level of certainty, uh, but also, as, as David was saying, to raise, and George was saying, to raise other issues, and we can work on those issues. That's fine. But we shouldn't let those 40 issues, if that's what they are, David, that's impressive that you, you've counted them, um, uh, get in the way of, of going ahead and, and implementing a system that, um, as Atai and Pascal were saying, uh, can be a historic, uh, historic achievement. The, the, the second thing, it, it, as long as we continue to focus on all these issues that are, that are there at a more detailed level and keep working on them after the, after the provisions are enacted in various countries, the second is the level of incentives that the prior panel talked about. And it, it seems to me that this project has evolved um, somewhat, both with the, uh, with the QDMTT and with the substance-based income exception, to, to being re really a, uh, a, a, a constraint on tax competition for businesses that earn excess returns and not necessarily uh, tax competition on, on real economic activities like hiring people uh, and investing in plant and equipment. And maybe that's not so bad. I mean, from a, from a US perspective, what really um, uh, motivated our multinationals to do economic activities outside the United States, in my judgment and experience, was not, uh, you know, was not a an incentive that related to the amount of capital they were investing or the number of employees they were hiring. Rather, it was the opportunity to get intellectual prop intellectual property profits associated with those economic activities. Uh, I mean, one of our big mistakes that I've talked about in the past was requiring that in order to avoid subpart F and and not be taxed by the United States. You had to do manufacturing outside the United States. So the manufacturing left the United States, not because of the incentives for manufacturing, but because of the incentives for IP that required you move the manufacturing in order to take advantage of them. Uh, we made a major mistake, and I was part of it because I was uh, in a congressional staffer when this was done, with respect to Puerto Rico 50 years ago, when we said, hey, if you manufacture in Puerto Rico, we'll give you a tax credit that is essentially equal to your income down there. So we gave a tax credit that related to income and not to activities. And what happened, what happened was we got a lot of income down there and not so many, not so many jobs and not so much investment because what the tax credit was stimulating was what was a taxable income rather than jobs or capital investments. So I would suggest that the QRTC, the refundable tax credit provision should be limited to those tax credits that are actually tied to things like wages and, and plant and equipment so that it kind of overlaps uh, with, the, with the SBIE type uh, stimulus to those kinds of investments. Because to my mind, if, if there are those limitations on both the, the credit mechanism for achieving tax competition and the SBIE, SBIE mechanism for achieving it, um, it, it may well have some incentive in some places for, you know, whether it's uh, clothing manufacturing or something else to, uh, to move locations, but in terms of the major multinationals that have excess profits, it just doesn't move the needle that much in, in my judgment. Uh, Kim Clausing had a 
uh, uh, testimony before the Senate Finance Committee and a paper she did before she became Deputy Assistant Secretary that showed uh, from country by country of reporting the ratio of, um, of assets to profits and employees to profits in the tax in various tax haven jurisdictions compared to that in other jurisdictions and and the ratios are are you know five to ten to one in some of the tax haven jurisdictions because again what's what is being in what, what is being shifted is income more than activities so i think from the u.s experience with puerto rico from the u uh, we would and, and uh and with our own multinationals uh, I would say that you are that even if you're allowing some competition by uh, allowing incentives that are tied to jobs and, and, and to capital to capital investment in tangible property, um, that's fine. Uh, that that you are still accomplishing a lot by having the <clears throat> the whole pillar two uh, provision apply to excess returns, which uh, super normal returns, as as Vicky uh, described them, uh, because from a from a U.S. point of view, that has been historically what has uh, what has been the the most difficult uh, consequence of tax competition. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. And uh, finally, we have Dan. I can't hear you, Dan. I'm not sure if it's just me, but I, I couldn't hear you just then. Still no. Are your earphones picking up your phone or something like that? No. You can't hear me. No, we can. You can hear me, excellent. I'm very sorry about that. So I'm gonna talk about treaties, tax treaties, how we amend them, why it matters. Why do we care about treaties in the context of pillar two? I think three reasons. First, the STTR, very relevant to developing countries, will require treaty change. I think everyone accepts that. Second, there are some who believe that the IIR and UTPR require treaty amendment, essentially because they're more than a mere CFC rule. I'm not going to take a view on that now. And there's Pillar 1. And Pillar 1 definitely requires treaty change. Now, of course, we're talking about Pillar 2 and not Pillar 1. But if Pillar 1 fails, then the future of Pillar 2 is, to say the least, in question. So the details of Pillar 1 may not be relevant to us today, but the life or death of Pillar 1, I think, probably is. So at this point, ordinarily, we'd have a long discussion about the practicalities of amending treaties, how you do it, how long it take, ratification, blah, blah, blah. But my understanding is that there is zero prospect of the US Senate agreeing to ratify a, a, any kind of treaty change to implement Pillar 1 or Pillar 2. And the US proposal is that this be achieved by treaty overrides. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the next three minutes whether you can implement Pillar 1, and to the extent you need to, Pillar 2, by overriding existing tax treaters. The US answer appears to be, yes, yes, of course you can. Why is this an issue? Because in the US, they override treaters all the time. And the same is true to a much lesser degree in the UK and a number of other states that are dualist, meaning, of course, that they're states where international treaties have no force of law domestically. You have to implement domestically separately to give the treaty life. On the other hand, in modest jurisdictions where treaties automatically have force of law, the question of whether you can override a treaty is often a difficult one. Now, there are some modest states which expressly have constitutional rules which tell you that international treaties have precedence over domestic law, so you cannot conceptually override a treaty in these countries. Uh, some examples are, I should say, when I mentioned individual countries, I have not done a full literature review and no one's been stupid enough to pay us to investigate this in detail. So, so what I say should be viewed as tentative. 
but I believe Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, Greece, Spain, Croatia all have constitutional rules, which essentially make a treaty override impossible. There are other modest states which don't have a constitutional rule, but it's generally accepted that, that you can't override treaties. Uh, Italy, Portugal, Kazakhstan have been mentioned. What about other dualist countries, I said the UK and the US are straightforward. Some of us aren't. Now, people often disagree whether Germany is monist or dualist. And for many years, it was in Germany a general view treaties were treaty overrides were unconstitutional. After a case in 2016, it now seems treaty overrides are lawful in Germany. France, I believe it is questionable if you can have a treaty override. Finland and Sweden, at the point has been litigated, rather complex results, but that was in the context of CFC rules. So the position is probably more complex and uncertain when it comes to pillar one and pillar two. And what about the EU, EU itself? It may be desirable in the end to implement pillar one and of course pillar two by directives, but no EU directive can breach international law. A treaty override, is it a breach of international law when it's a very peculiar form of treaty override that all parties may actually agree to, even if they're not amending the treaty? So what does this mean? I think it means that in some countries, there may be an obstacle to pillar one and to the extent you need to amend treaties, pillar two implementation, and that is either going to stop them implementing in that way or create the potential for uncertainty and litigation. If they do, it means there's a potential coordination problem with the any EU implementation and again, risk, risk of litigation. So my view is that this turns the question of the constitutional status of treaty overrides from the academic question it's been for many years into quite an important practical question, which could, in the worst case scenario, mean that pillar one becomes unimplementable, and that in turn could be a serious problem for the implementation of pillar two. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. Now, um, I, I had thought of a few questions to ask, um, but, but one, question which, to my, which arises to my mind from all your presentations is what is still up for grabs as in what changes can still be made um, and um, I, I was thinking about this because think about Georgia's uh, um, the issues that Georgia uh, highlighted about um, the possible double taxation that can arise in practice and some of the issues that Dave uh, mentioned also about the, some of the difficulties with the current model rules. So one question, you know, made me think, okay, but can we still, is it still possible to change model rules or, or is your understanding that those rules are what we have and, and now we need to move on? And I'm asking this Georgia particularly because at one stage, Pascal today said, um, you know, we have to find proper ways to deal uh, with double taxation. So there seems to be at least a, you know, and, and the inclusive framework documentation said, you know, throughout the process, you know, one, we have to design rules which don't give rise to double taxation. So if now, once the rules have been produced, we have identified issues of double taxation, what does that mean? Does it mean we can go back and revise the rules? Is still, is this, is your understanding that this is still uh, on the table? John, so I have to say that I don't do that job anymore, so I really don't know how much latitude we have to change the rules. But uh, we still have time, especially if in Europe we'll see a delayed implementation, say, to 2024. And there is still the implementation guideline or framework that David has cited before. So there is still technical work that is being uh, going on. So, And I think that when we are talking about issues like double taxation, we should really make an effort to eliminate uh, those elements from, from the implementation, because this is enforced at the OECD. It has a very broad meaning uh, if it remains in the international rules. And also, I think it's understandable that such a big agreement that was designed so quickly still needs um, some uh, adjustment around the edges. So it's not surprising. It's, it should not be, uh, should not, you know, be a problem for, for everyone. Um, I think um, 
that for those implementation issues that have really very little to do with the political agreement, we, we should work on that. And also thinking of starting with a system that already has a lot of friction in it and then having to change it every year, I think it would be a nightmare scenario for the economy. These changes, this continual uncertainty has enormous concrete uh, costs for the economy. So. Um, I, I don't agree with the idea of starting because we need to start and then we'll see how things go. This is very harmful for the economy, I think. But David probably has a, a, a much closer view on what this would imply uh, for firms like his. Yes, because I was thinking about this also during Paul's comment when Paul said, you know, we shouldn't let the perfect get into the way of the good. So that made me think, okay, but what if we identify an issue, I mean, what what can we do? Is it can these if an issue can't be amended through um, uh, changes to the commentary? Are we still is it still possible to um, to suggest changes to the model rules? I don't know what David, Dan, and Vicky or Paul's uh, views are on this. Is is this still up? You know, is this still possible? Sorry, Paul. Yeah, I, I I'll, I'll speak for it. It seems to me there has to be an open ended process going forward for refinements uh, because nobody gets it right the first time. I mean, again, I use our guilty example. Our, our guilty was enacted and was and was so wrong in so many ways, and we're still trying to get out from under it. Th this is much less, uh, pillar two has, has much fewer problems than, gu than guilty had when it was enacted, obviously. But there's no reason why uh, the inclusive framework shouldn't continue to, to hear what everybody sees are problems with it. If there are transfer pricing problems, although Georgia, I think part of the problem is the lack of clarity on what's unilateral transfer pricing adjustments and, and bilateral transfer pricing adjustments, because I, I at least read um, the rules and commentary to allow retroactive adjustments where there are bilateral transfer pricing adjustments that are made on audit. And, and I think I, and I agree with you, it does make sense to have transfer pricing be applied back to the year in which the income is adjusted. Um, but I do think it has to be essentially a living orgasm, uh, organism, uh, in, uh, or, organism, because otherwise we're just going to freeze things uh, that don't make sense. But I'd be interested in David's view. Yeah, thank, thanks, Paul. I mean, I, I think 137 or 141 countries have come to agreement on this. Uh, I think if, if they were to agree there should be a change, I'm sure they could find a way to, to make the change. Uh, I don't think it's beyond the art of the possible. Um, I suspect that won't happen, I think, because it will be enormously complicated for it to happen um, when countries have started implementing it. Uh, and I think that's really where the, the, the rubber hits the road. And, and I, I, I don't know enough about Guilty to, to comment on, on, on Paul's comment that you know, Guilty had more things wrong with it. But I think when you have 137 countries and not all 137 are gonna implement them next year, but a number of them are going to implement them, implement these rules soon. I think when you get to that point where the rules are being implemented, it becomes more complicated to change the underlying source document. Um, when, when a big part of the, the, the agreement is that countries will not divert too far from that source document. So I think, um, the, I think most of the areas where perhaps there would need to be a, a change, as people might see it, would probably be best dealt with through the implementation framework. Um, because a big part of this agreement is around uh, qualifying regimes, qualifying domestic minimum taxes, qualifying refundable tax uh, credits. You know, all of these things are going to be implemented by multiple countries in slightly different ways. There isn't yet any clarity on what will make any of these regimes qualifying, as far as I can tell. Um, you know, we wouldn't expect the odd word of the model rules being changed would result in a regime becoming non-qualifying. But how much wiggle room is there? And, and if there is a little wiggle room in how they're implemented and how they're assessed and who qualifies them and under what circumstances, um, then I think, I think that really relieves a lot of this tension in the system around, you know, these are the model rules. You implement model rules and, and you can't depart from them. Uh, and I think, you know, those are the real questions that I'm hopeful the implementation framework will answer. And they'll answer in a way that does mean if there are things that need to be changed, 
you know, in the model rules or in the implementation of the model rules, that that can be done in a pragmatic way that gives taxpayers certainty, um, that recognizes there might need to be a little bit of departure either in one country implementing or in all countries implementing uh, without this, uh, this sort of sort of Damocles over every single implementation or every single qualifying refundable tax credit or domestic qualifying domestic minimum tax regime that it all needs to be signed off every single time there's a change because that's an inherent complexity in the regime that I think I just I'm, I'm hopeful the implementation framework will give us ways to work around these kind of issues uh, rather than having something set in stone that we just have to live with uh, forevermore. Yeah, so, I mean, just thinking about it. Um, so let's say, um, what, what if a country says, look, I, I signed up to this, to the political agreement on, on, in October, but that was based on my understanding that we could still compete by offering qualifying refundable tax credits. Um, I mean, could, they, um, could we now, are we now saying that we can, you know, the countries, the critical mass can turn around and say, okay, whatever we agreed on qualifying refundable tax credit at the time the political agreement was reached is now going to be narrowed and you can have, um, you know, you can, what you, if you thought you could compete uh, through this channel, now um, that channel has been significantly uh, narrowed for you. So there's, there's this level, I think, at which it becomes interesting as to, you know, if, if, um, are we bound by what was agreed at a certain point because that's when countries gave the political agreement to, and we can think about this at a, this technical level, but there's also the bigger picture issue, which, which Dan brought up and Sol Picciotto has commented on and I thought was very striking. In, um, so Pascal made a comment, which seemed to be different to the comment I've heard that the people make in the past. So in the past, pillar one and pillar two were always sold as a package. So I, I've heard time and again that pillar one and pillar two are not intellectually or conceptually linked, but they're linked politically and countries are agreeing to one package. Uh, you know, and some countries might agree to pillar two, even though they're not very keen on it because they're, you know, the trade off is other countries are going to agree to pillar one, even though they're not very keen on it. But it, I heard Pascal today said that pillar two will happen, you know, and then whether pillar one happens or not, that's a separate question. I, I found that quite striking. I don't know if the rest of you did. Um, so one, did I hear Pascal correctly when he said that? And um, two, I'd like to ask Paul, is your assessment of the chances of pillar one uh, being adopted in the US as uh, pessimistic as Dan's? So by adopted, well, rat ratified by, by, well, the, by the Senate as a treaty amendment. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, it, Dan is is correct um, if we just did it by treaty. If we did it by legislative override, and that's not by any means a sure thing because it would require um, the unanimity among Senate Democrats and near unanimity in the House, um, and then had treaty negotiations with those countries that needed to have their treaties uh, revised the dynamic in the Senate would be quite different because, because from a U.S. perspective, the treaty had already been overridden. And, and so that, um, that element of it is no longer there. Uh, it's really just trying to conform the treaty to domestic law. And I think the treaty dynamic on that would be quite different. Okay, so Paul, is, is um, so you are you saying you're less uh, pessimistic as, as than well? I'm, than... I'm 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 pessimistic about getting legislation done. I think that that um, that you know is probably going to depend on the outcome of the elections this year because if we uh, if if the Democrats lose the House or the Senate, then it's got to be bipartisan. And at this point, pillar one is not doesn't see, show many signs of being bipartisan. Um, so, um, you know, we, we probably, uh, if, if, if we have a shift in the House or the Senate, we probably have a stalemate uh, on whatever is not enacted this year. And clearly pillar one's not gonna be enacted uh, this year, whether pillar two get, whether the Biden administration's changes that would give us a qualified IIR, at least hopefully give us a qualified IIR, we'll get enacted. That's, that's 
you know, that's not terribly likely right now either. So um, we're not we're not in good shape from the point of view of pillar one and pillar two in the United States these days. But so put in another way, and, and I'll open this up. Do you think some countries will be surprised to hear that pillar two is going ahead, and that you know there's been a decoupling of pillar one and pillar two? Um, well, the, I mean, the wasn't the UK the main country that really insisted on the linkage? Maybe there were others, uh, but in the UK, I, I take it the D linkage is now accepted, given that the UK corporate rate's going up to twenty five percent. But also the, the, the creation of these domestic top-up taxes means that there's much more in it for the UK and, and other European jurisdictions in Pillar 2 than, than there was in its initial conception. So perhaps the UK and some others will be more willing to never have Pillar 1. But that's clearly not true for all. The recent EU Council discussion, there were some countries that, that were really very resistant to the idea of a legal delinking. And even the others, there was pretty general agreement that the mechanism was a package and the commission was going to present an announcement to confirm that they were viewed as a package, albeit no legal linkage. Okay, did anyone else have a uh, comment on this or can we move on to another point? Okay, so the other point I wanted to um, to, to ask you about is, is that of incentives. So I heard uh, Itai say that it's important that Pillar 2 does not uh, remove countries' ability to provide uh, Pigouvian subsidies. Um, but I also heard uh, Pascal talk about, you know, a volume of wasteful tax incentives. So there seem to be, uh, you know, uh, so pillar two will have an impact on, on countries' abilities to provide incentives, but there's also the sense that we don't want uh, incentives to be um, too much of, a, of an open door, which allow countries uh, to compete uh, to compete strong. Now, uh, BIAC have, have written a letter to the OECD um, raising some concerns about uh, the impact, the negative impact of pillar two on incentives. So I, I thought I'd start by asking Dave and, and, and others whether you were concerned that Pillar 2 could have a negative impact on countries' ability to provide incentives to, for green investment, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, th thanks, John. I mean, I, I saw that letter from BIAC. I wasn't, um, I wasn't particularly involved in, in writing it. I think it does draw out uh, a, a, a challenge within the, the Pillar 2 regime and it, it makes clear a challenge in the international tax framework going forward that um, you know, are there things that we should be allowed tax incentives for? And if so, what are they? And I think that's a more interesting question than what form should those tax incentives take? Um, I think it's really quite facts and circumstances dependent. The, the way that Pillar 2 seems to work for me, it's not eliminated tax competition. It's just significantly changed the dynamics of which tax incentives will be effective and which tax incentives will, will not be effective. Uh, it seems to me, uh, I'm sure Vicky will be able to comment, uh, and there's some more thinking on this sort of thing than I have, but it seems to me that countries with high tax rates will be able to offer tax incentives to businesses that are already subject to lots of tax in their country without their tax rate dropping below 15%. Um, but for countries with lower tax rates, or for those that may have high tax rates but want to attract investment from a new investor that doesn't have lots of tax presence already in their country, um, the incentives, the traditional tax incentives, which is lower the rate, they'll be much less effective uh, for, for in, that, in that type of scenario than they would be for a country that's already got a taxpayer there that it wants to give a tax incentive for that's already paying a high rate of tax, unless, of course, they're using qualifying refundable tax credits, which, which in themselves will require a much earlier cash outflow than a tax holiday or a reduced rate would. So you know, there are options to use these tax incentives, but they may not be as appealing to countries because they're gonna require an earlier cash outflow. In particular, things like super deductions. I think that's gonna become quite troublesome for, for large groups actually, because particularly in, in light of what George was saying earlier around the, the, the situation where tax is payable when a super deduction is used, you know, even if it's in a loss making year. So if you've got a long life investment that's gonna generate a few years of losses, before becoming profitable, 
you would actually be worse claiming the super deduction in the in the loss making early years than than if the super deduction hadn't been available at all because you'd have a top up tax in those early investment years when you've not got the profits to pay. Um, uh, then, and if you hadn't taken the super deduction at all, you wouldn't have tax to pay until you started making profits. So then there's the points around payroll taxes and, and other tax incentives. So ultimately, as I say, I don't think it's that tax incentives won't be available. I don't. I think they, they will still be available for a wide range of things, but it does significantly change the dynamics of for which countries and in which situations and for which companies they will actually be effective. Yeah. Great points. Thank you very much. Uh, one, 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 que one question I have that maybe some of the other panelists know more about than I do. With the qualified refundable tax credits, given that they are essentially grants through the tax system, aren't they subject to the state aid rules in the EU and also the WTO rules from a trade perspective that might constrain countries uh, willingness or ability to uh, to offer those kinds of uh, advantages to taxpayers is that is that right or is that wrong? In the EU, that's correct. Certainly, when it comes to anything new, so some so some uh, tax incentives are so old they're essentially grandfathered. But if any new measure would have tough state aid challenges in the EU, and indeed the UK because of our semi importation. Right. Forward right. So I just wanted to ask um, Vicky if she'd like to come in on incentives uh, and whether low-income countries might feel under pressure to convert their incentives to qualified oh. refundable tax credits. Okay. Just to say quickly, um, the uh, I couldn't agree more with something Paul, I think it was, who said earlier, which is that simply reducing the rate in whatever way, either by just reducing it or by giving a tax holiday, which is essentially reducing the rate to zero, is perhaps one of the most, perhaps the most ineffective way to actually generate more investment. And certainly as he was pointing out, one would want to, uh, something like very accelerated depreciation for physical assets or direct job related, uh, incentives for actually forming, although those are very hard to do, but leaving that aside, I think that all to some extent just goes to um, emphasize what also has been said, which is that I think Dave just repeated it, that the notion that it matters whether the exact, whether it's done through a qualified refundable tax credit with all its bells and whistles, we really should probably much more be focusing on what's actually a reasonable tax incentive. If you're going to have to have a tax incentive for a low income country, at least, what's effective? Um, I don't think that the complex notion of, I think a, a system that creates a complex set of incentives for introducing even more complex provisions is something that's gonna to be too great for the very low income countries which suffer radically from capacity problems, which in fact, it, it must fairly must be said is one reason they've used tax holidays. Um, but uh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that uh, since I can see that we're, we could go on, yeah. but I'll leave it I at mean, that. I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought we could have an interesting conversation about the level of complexity actually, and, and whether um, the importance of a safe harbor and whether we think we can uh, achieve a sensible safe harbor. But we've, we've run out of time. So let me uh, thank everyone on this uh, panel for a, a great discussion. And I'll thank my colleagues at the CBT and Pascal and Itai for the, their intervention in the first panel. Uh, thank you, everyone. A lot to uh, think about. And uh, we'll see you at the next uh, CBT um, conference, which will happen, as Mike said, late June, early July. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.